for love on air. I'm gonna hit my hit my YouTube link so I can pop out the chat. And if you're new, I'm Mama Beth World. I am a psychologist. You can just call me Beth. You don't have to call me Mama Beth. But um, I'm a therapist, and I work with people who have a variety of different mental disorders. So we're going to be talking tonight about depression, anxiety, um, what makes it so, what makes it happen biologically, and how it continues psychologically. How we actually we actually make ourselves sicker, and you probably didn't know that. Now, a lot of people don't, but, uh, you know, when we start out with depression, hi, Epi Junkie. Hi, Colleen. I'm so glad to see people coming in. It makes me happy. Um, but when, when you're depressed and you don't get the help you need, it gets worse and it, your brain actually gets kind of trained to continue, you know, to keep feeling the way it is, to keep having those thoughts. It's the same with anxiety. If we don't get treatment for anxiety, if we don't find the root cause of it, then it's really hard to get better. So we're going to talk about this tonight. Now, as you probably know, hi, Kaylee. Um, as you probably know, Twitter is just being terrible. They, uh, I don't know why, but I got locked out of my Twitter account and I can't get back in. I have all my passwords, all my codes. It's supposed to send me an SMS text to my phone. It's got the right phone number, but I'm never getting a text. So I don't know what's going on with Twitter, but if you would like, I'm a medic and this is creeping up on me quickly, so I'm very interested. Thanks so much for sharing. Hi, Puddin. Listen, if you're starting to have symptoms of depression, the quicker you treat it, whether it's uh, with medication and therapy, just medication, just therapy, whatever you do, it will help you fight it off and keep it away. And that's that's the, what we want to do. Nobody wants to be depressed their entire life, right? You want to be able to, you know, say, okay, I had a bad spot. We got through it and we feel better. So I want, I want to give you all, you know, the factual, scientific, you know, hardcore information that you need to understand what's going on. Because if you've seen any of my, any of my live streams before, I'm all about understanding what is going on with your body. Whether it's uh, being a diabetic or, you know, having a rheumatoid arthritis, like I do. Um, if it's a physical illness, if it's a mental problem, when you understand it, you can fix it. You know where to go. You know who to see. Um, you can find the answers out there. And some things you have to do on your own. Some things you need medical help for. Sometimes you just need someone to guide you down the right path. But... I don't want anybody suffering unnecessarily from depression. Now, if you are depressed, like Epijunkie, you said that, you know, you're starting into this pro program, or shoot, you're starting down this path with depression. Um, if you would like to give me, uh, let me put my email in the chat, and uh, you are more than welcome to send me an email, and I'll send you a link, and you are, you're, able to come up on panel all you need is a headset and uh, you'll need to download Google Hangouts if you haven't already but uh, you can come on and we can talk and maybe we can help you find some answers so it's world at gmail.com and if you haven't noticed already I'm not in the kitchen I uh, was gonna go to the office and then I thought no I'm just really more comfortable in the den um, the dogs are here with me as you say, he's such an attention whore. He thinks he belongs on TV. But and then Spanky's down here licking my hand. Go lay down, boys. Go lay down. Brian, get off of the back of the couch. I don't know why, but wieners want to be on the back. Hi, I'm Reva. It's so good to see you. I remember you from last night. Thank you for coming in. Um, but all you have to do is send me if you send me an email to Mama Best World, I'll send you the link to the Hangouts and. Uh, you can come up and you can talk about your story. You don't have to. You don't have to turn your turn your camera on, turn your mic on, so I can hear you. But you don't have to turn your camera on. No, we love. I promise, I'm a very sane girl. Just to wrap up. You know what? That's 
you know, you bring up an interesting topic. People say, oh, they're depressed. They're, they have mental illness. Such a shame. Or they're insane. You know, that's, that's a hard thing to go. Listen, I don't know of anybody in their life that hasn't had a low spot or gone through some depression, gone through some uh, panicked moments. You know, these are all things that, that we deal with. And some hide it better than others. I'm not really good at hiding it. When I've been depressed, I've been depressed and everybody knew it. And most people avoided me because it was just, I, I was very vocal about what I was depressed about. So, you know, and when I've been anxious or worried, I'm, I'm big about sharing. And please, everybody say hello to everybody else in the, in the chat. I'm so tickled to have everyone in here. Um, if you'll share the chat on your Twitter, since my Twitter's kind of janky, uh, today, it is not wanting to cooperate. If you'll share the stream on your Twitter, so that way other people know to come in. And hopefully everybody has their notification boxes on, so if they want to watch this. Um, I found with a lot of my, a lot of my live streams, people watch them afterwards. So that's okay too. But um, I'd like everybody to see it live and be able to participate in the chat as long as possible. But, you know, there is nothing shameful about going through depression. Depression is caused both by clinical, what we call clinical depression, which just means that maybe genetically you're predisposed to uh, depression. Maybe you're the, we know that there is a gene in our DNA. There's a gene that controls the serotonin. Now, the serotonin is your feel-good drug, okay? If you don't have enough serotonin in your, you know, in your system, you're going to feel like crap. You're going to be depressed. You're going to be down. You're going to not have energy. Um, you may have trouble sleeping. You may sleep all the time. It, just, it affects people differently. But so we know there's a genetic factor. So there's, we know there's an environmental factor. If you're going through a divorce, it's very likely to have some depression. Um, if you've lost your job, if your job's too stressful, or um, maybe you've lost a family member, maybe you're in grief from that. All these things, you know, cause depression. And depending on our own body chemistry and the way we handle things, sometimes it can send us in a deep spiral. Sometimes it's not as bad and we can kind of handle it with maybe some talk therapy, talking, talking to a therapist, talk to a friend. You know, being able to work through it. But other times we need, you know, an antidepressant. And we're going to talk. Um, <laughs> it's Mama Beth, <laughs> Melissa May, but everybody does that. So there's no, it's fun. We joke about it because she and I are probably the furthest apart <laughs> that you can get to people. I'm a Christian, but I don't tell anybody they're going to hell. <laughs> and, and I'm actually a psychologist, uh, licensed went to school all these years and all of that. And so when I give advice, you know, I have the, you know, the practical background, the educational background for it. She, she just tells you what she thinks. So, but it's really funny that our names are similar. I've had my name, I've had been called Mama Bath by patients since, oh Lord, I guess since I, since I started working with my first group, you know, when, right when I was, through getting through my math and my before my master's before, at the end of my bachelor's degree, I worked with uh, I worked with a lot of young young adults and they didn't like to call me. Yeah, you know, I'm not a doctor and I make no bones about it, but they didn't like they didn't like calling me Mrs. You know, and plus I was getting married and I was good things. They were just like, can we just call you Mama Beth? And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And so it stuck. And uh, so I'm real proud of that name. I think I think I got it. You know, with, I think I got it with love and trust. So, um, hi, little miss SPFU. <laughs> it's all right, Melissa, honey. You only went four years to the left. Um, are you talking about going for your bachelor's? You know, it's, <sighs> some people find it just overwhelming. I, I talked to a lot of my daughter's friends when they were in college because I was in college the same time they were. And, um, you know, because I went back to school, my my original education started out nursing, ended up business, went into advertising and marketing and loved it. And then I got tired of it. I wanted to go back for what I wanted. You stuck with psych tech. You're stuck with psych tech. You know what? But if you enjoy it, 
that's what counts. And if you're good at it, you know, um, I really enjoy school. In fact, I was just talking to my husband last week. I think I want to go back. He's like, what are you going to go back for? And I said, I don't know. Maybe I'll get my doctor. I like the master's. Why not? You know, um, I had Kimberly Chiari. Listen, if you don't know her, please follow her channel. She um, explains about chronic pain and Chiari syndrome. And uh, it's something that we all need to learn about. She's extremely educated on her, her illness. And uh, I'm just very happy to see you in here, Belle Baby. And yeah, you know, Lumis SCFU, it, it, there are so many choices with it. You can go, like, okay, I couldn't figure out at first what I wanted to do for my master's. And I ended up getting family counseling, you know, uh, family and adolescent. And uh, it's all right. It's, you know, it's kind of a broad spectrum. It's kind of like being a GP. You know, you hit a little bit of everything. And then I was like, you know what? I really like. I like forensics and I like uh, criminal criminal psychology. I like uh, I like to study. The, I know this sounds so silly. Serial killers, the mass murders, why they do it, what's what's the root cause? And so I got a second master's. I didn't go on to my doctor, and uh, now I'm kind of like maybe I want to be cop doctor. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Um, it's so good to see you. Yeah, there has to be a psych tech on staff to refer out. And, you know, I've, I've talked about working with prisoners and working in jail. And um, it was fascinating. It was absolutely. And, you know, I'm going to have to sit up to get my drink. I'm going to get back here. But um, you can see my Santori. I'm a we're big art fan. So that's the Charles Santori behind me. But let me get my, I don't want to put my boobs in the camera. Y'all know how I feel about that. Um, but, you know, I, I thought about if I, if I went back and I got my doctorate in psychology, you know, I, I won't have to prescribe anything, which I recommend prescriptions now. But um, I just really like working, working with the prisoners. They, you know, we get this idea from all these TV shows that they're in there and they're just hardened criminals and they're never going to get any better and they don't want to get any better and they just want to. They just want to keep with the life. They don't. Most of the, honestly, I'd say about 90% of the people I worked with wanted to change their lives. They did not want to come back to prison. They wanted to learn how to operate in the real world. And, do I, yeah, look at that. Brian, if you all have wieners, you see what I deal with. Why am I on this over? Are you peeking? Are you peeking? I'll see you. Come on down here. Say hi to everybody. This is Brian. He's the main one. <laughs> and Spanky's over there. But yeah, you know how it is. With, uh, if you have waiters, they, they peak. But, uh, you know, most of the prisoners that I worked with, they wanted to change. They wanted to figure out what was wrong, what was wrong. A lot of them, you know, 100%. Of all criminals in uh, prisons have one thing in common. They all experience corporal punishment as children. That's why I say don't hit your kids. Don't spank your kids. You know, people say, oh, it doesn't hurt them. It doesn't hurt them. Well, it might not, but then again, it might. You know? So, you know, I I just, that's that's why I'm really against child abuse is because after, after working with after working with the prisoners, you know, I saw a lot of similarities in things that um, kids I grew up with. Because I know, hey. But um, Kimberly said, I was undecided in college. I was leaning towards teaching. I took every psych the college offered. You know what? I haven't taken a psychology class that I did not enjoy. I really, I, I took, because I have the, my degrees, all my degrees are science degrees, which means that I took all the all the hard classes, all the science classes. You can get a um, Bachelor of Arts in Psychology or you can get a Bachelor of Science and same with the Masters, Bachelor of Arts or Science. I chose to do science. It's a better degree and you get a better job. But, um, you know, yeah, working in prison is change your outlook. You, you learn so much about the human environment 
And like you mentioned, solitary. Solitary is, I, I think it should be outlawed. Frankly, um, it causes such, there is, we are social creatures. And, you know, we're talking about depression on here. We are social creatures. If you are not touched by another human, if you don't see face to face another human for enough time each day, if you don't, it has to be, a, it can be a touch on the hand, it can be a hug, whatever. When they're in solitary confinement, the lights are on all the time, at least in the prison that I, I worked in, uh, the lights are on 24 seven. It's cool. It's way too cool. You never get warm enough. See, that's, that's a little way to torture you. You never get any human contact. The guards don't speak as they fly the tray in for your meals. They don't speak as they, as the tray slides out. You get an hour a day, um, in a yard, in a concrete yard. And they sometimes will jog in place. They'll be jumping back. They'll try to get some exercise, but they never get any real sun either. And that's a deprivation of vitamin D. Um, Solitary will drive you mad. If you're in solitary, it, you can put a normal person with no sight problems in solitary. And I guarantee after a couple of years, they're going to be batshit. And I do mean batshit. It's, it's awful. Hi, Cammy at this. Thank you for joining. See, Cammy, that's why, um, that's why I tell people who don't have, like, if you're alone all the time, it's going to cause you to be depressed. Let me get this on the couch. Um, we have to see people. We have to, even if it's just the neighbor, you know, even if it's just talking across the fence. Um, it will, yeah. And, you know, hi, Cynthia. You have to talk to people. You have to, even if it's just going to the, and I, I swear, even if it's just going to the corner store and getting a morning cup of coffee, and maybe a donut or a muffin and talking to the cashier. That's why people stand and talk to cashiers a lot. You know, in the little convenience store, but it's on my screen. Um, because they're alone. And that may be the only time they get out during the day. But we need to have social contact and not just online. Like I talk to a lot of people. Um, you know, I have several patients that uh, work with online because they either physically cannot get in to see me or, you know, they have agoraphobia. We're working through that, things like that, social anxiety. But even if we have social anxiety, we need to have people that we're comfortable enough with that we can talk to, that we can see, we can do face to face. We have to have that. Hi, Sandy. I hope you're cooking something good. Yeah, and Kim, uh, Kimberly, see, if you're in bed alone, you know, it's it's really good to be able to get online and talk to people. But you also need to have somebody at least once, twice a day come in, put their hand on your arm, you know, maybe kiss your forehead, ask you how you're doing, have a short conversation. You'll find a huge difference. When people isolate, whether it's by choice or not, um, you, we start losing our serotonin production. The dopamine production goes up. Um, you know, our our body chemistry actually changes. And I want I want everyone to know that we can change this. You know, with help. You know, I have been I have been so severely depressed. I've been suicidal. And you know, I don't talk a lot about that because I don't want to trigger anyone else. But during during that time i was alone a lot my daughter was with her father um she was visiting him and then it, it was like it was a series of she was with him and then she was with my parents because they were going on vacation somewhere and but i was alone for a long time and i had left my job and i hadn't started my new one yet and i was so alone and so lonely and all of the negative thoughts started pouring in and I, I really, I, it was a hard time. And, um, you know, I think that's why I'm a little more empathetic for people who have suffered with depression so bad. Um, because I've experienced it. 
I make it a point to take a solitary daily and spend at least five minutes a day with each inmate, and it made such a difference. I'm sure it did. Yeah, that will be a huge difference because you're going from zero to, you know, fulfillment. They need to speak. They need to see you. They need to hear a human voice. They need to have contact. We, we're social creatures. And Cammie says, in my office, there was a guy who would call all the time and it bugs people. I always talked to him for however long he needed because I knew he didn't need anything. He was just lonely. And, you know, that's the thing. That's a kindness. And I'm glad you did that because, who knows, you may have saved him from from going down here further to where he didn't, he didn't feel like he had anybody that cared. And, you know, you may have saved his, saved his life. Mac and cheese. I'm Reva says she's cooking. We don't eat mac and cheese in this house. It was in my wedding vows. And if you don't know that story, I'll tell it to you sometime. If you want to hear it, why, why we don't eat mac and cheese and why it was included in my vows. Um, your mom visits you. Okay, you watch TV together in the afternoon unless you're feeling real bad. Good. Good, because you need that. Even if it's something as simple as just watching TV, watching a soap opera. Um, a lot of times, if someone can't be there in person, if they can call you on the phone, and watch a show with you. Watch a TV show. You watch Real Housewives. Yeah, you know I'm a housewives addict. My husband and I, before we got married, we would watch that together because actually one of my best friend's husbands got hooked on it, and he told her about it, and she told me about it, and I told my husband about it. And so every night we would be on the phone together. We would watch TV together, and that that really bonded us. That that helped us bond. We'd laugh and do things like that. But if you don't have someone who can who can be physically present with you, at least get them on the phone and talk to them. Yeah. But that makes it, it makes a lot of difference. Y'all need to hush about the mac and cheese because all I've had is some crab rangoon and I got like three pieces of it and then I had to rush up here because my husband was late from work and I could I could eat a entire thing of Velveeta mac and cheese because I don't get it. I'm jealous. <laughs> Steve says, I hibernate a lot. Back in the early crisis days with me, I had agoraphobia so bad. And I still have it, but not as bad as before. And you're still in spine, by lady. Um, that's what we do. And it's, it, it just, it makes it worse, but we can't help doing it a lot of times. It takes somebody, you know, grabbing us by the hand and saying, hey, get out of the house. Um, agoraphobia. It comes after when you have a fear of going out. Well, first of all, usually you can't go out. There's some reason that stops you from being able to leave. You may be taking care of somebody. You may be, uh, don't drive and you're not into gardening or you don't have a garden. So you don't get out of the house and you just kind of, kind of stay in the house because you're used to it. And then it gets to where you get, you're, you're kind of timid going out. You're like, well, I don't need to go out and I can order. You know, I could order online anything I need. And, you know, now that you can get groceries sent to you, Amazon Prime, shoot. You know, that's taken a lot of people's going out and socializing away. The Internet has really hurt us in a social setting because we don't need, like, I'm talking to all of you all, but I don't need to be directly in front of you. Like, if we were doing group therapy, we'd all be in a room. We'd have chairs. We'd all have a cup of coffee or you know, Diet Coke or something like that, half of you'd be smoking. <laughs> it seems like therapy brings out the cigarettes, and that's fine. But we would all be seeing each other and hearing each other and hearing each other's voices. But whereas I can reach so many people here, but we're not getting that one-on-one -on -one contact. And that's one of the things that I want to encourage anyone who is going into depression, who is starting to feel depression, Find someone online that you talk to and that you trust. And they don't even have to live near you. But exchange phone numbers, real life phone numbers. Call each other. Text each other. Texting isn't quite as good, but calling and hearing a voice is so, it, it, it brings up, it, it gives us such stimulation mentally and emotionally. And it will bring us from down here up to here. Just to hear someone's voice, to hear that someone cares. You know, hi, Megan. I am so glad to see you. I've been watching your videos, doll baby. They're so good. 
but the internet hates me too right now. Um, Steve says, I feel safe in the house, so I stayed in because so much was going on, but you go out now, but you can't take large crowds. That's good that you're making those steps. You know, um, if you start out, you know, going where there's just a couple people, then, you know, maybe, maybe there's a fair going on or, you know, a festival or something like that. You go, but maybe you only see one or two people you know, but you kind of hide in the crowd. You can work your way up or maybe take a friend and that way they take your focus on the fact that there's a crowd around. And, you know, we, we have to kind of, um, it's called a virgin, not a virgin therapy, but immersion therapy. And it's where we start out with a little bit at a time and we work our way up. You know, it's, you have to, you have to just do it a little bit each day and be working on it and have your goal. And then, then you're going to feel more comfortable in crowds. Okay. Wait a minute. We're still talking about, okay. You know what, Cynthia, I love the fact that nursing homes and hospitals for their, um, for their elder care units are letting people bring in dogs. In fact, um, I know a lady who had four bees on freeze and they're hypoallergenic, which I never knew they were hypoallergenic dogs until then. But anyway, bees on freeze, uh, nobody can be, nobody's allergic to it. So she would wash them and get them all groomed up, maybe pretty. And then she would come in and bring them to the, this was back when I was pregnant with my daughter and I was working at the hospital and I was still in nursing school. But, um, I loved working, working with, uh, you know, the older patients, the ones who couldn't speak, who needed to be fed or whatever. They were so, to me, it was like they were babies again. You know, we start out helpless and then we end up helpless. And I just, my heart went out and, um, you know, but they would light up when they saw the dogs. Now, I have never seen anybody bring a chicken, but I think that's, I think that's just awesome. I think that's hilarious. Okay, Cammie, we will see you at, hopefully after your phone call. If not, then the next time. So glad to have you here. But, um, you know, but I see, I, you know, I've gone into different nursing homes because, you know, you have patients everywhere when you work in psych. Um, as a therapist, you know, a, a lot of times the therapy that I do is with the nurse's aides. Let me tell you, there's no harder job, I think, than a CNA. Um, they really, I, I have total respect for them. I was one while I was in nursing school, and they really, oh, they are the backbone. You know, the, the RNs and the different therapists and stuff, they do a wonderful job too, but I tell you what, I would talk to the CNAs and I would hear their concerns and hear their worries. And, you know, they just, I don't know, I guess I'm a softie and they touch me. And so I try to help them. Yeah, you know, the nurses had so many that they don't get really attached as much, it seemed like. But the aides, oh, they sure do. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I see how they treat the patients and how, how they really identify. They see them as their grandmothers, their mothers, you know, their aunts, their sisters, and they, they really take care of them. But like I say, bringing the animals in is fantastic. And if you run a foster, you know that, okay, y'all know that I do super chats. And by the way, I'm raising money for, uh, Les, and I don't know if I've got any, anyone in here that's, uh, is in her is in her streams too but please go on her live stream her paypal is in there it's s s c a n fan f a n at um, yahoo.com that's her paypal and please donate we are trying to get her a computer so she can do because you know her live streams that's her way of socializing but also she's going to be she's going to be doing some work uh, online or getting her an online position so that uh, she can they can make the money and Megan says with my anxiety and depression it gives me flight mode I just want to run but now I can't run anymore so it gets difficult okay Megan can you please oh I forgot your her mod please put her information in here you know what let me make you a mod real quick doll baby because this is very important. This is more important than just buying a computer for somebody who doesn't have the money 
uh, who doesn't have the money to get it. Okay, Megan, I made you a mod in here. So if you could just, um, if you could put in the links, that would be great. Yeah, computers are bad when, when you hibernate, um, because you don't have to go out. You can order everything you need. I, I can go to Walmart online and, uh, order everything but fresh meat and milk and eggs. And I don't know if I can do that because I haven't tried it yet, but I can order everything and they will send it to my house. And I know Amazon Prime in most cities does the same thing. They'll, any kind of groceries. I know it's fresh, fresh fruit and all the old things. So, um, thank you, doll baby. Um, so you don't have to force yourself if you want to eat to go out. You know, you don't have to have the interactions in the grocery store. You know, um, you don't have to see people, you know, and that's not good. We need to be getting out. Now, I wanted to go over a few things because I'll tell you the truth. I got mad. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're in there all the time, Steve. You're like me. You come in whenever whenever it's on and you can find it. That's, that's what I do. I love Les. I think she is one of the kindest, sweetest people that I know. And uh, I just got an email. And I will not read it on live stream, but we will talk. We'll talk later, okay? Um, I had someone say that, you know, another channel. Well, let's just face it. It's the one that everybody tells me. That's Mama Bear's channel. She was going on there and saying that people who had depression, people who were cutting, people who had uh, suicidal ideations or who committed suicide were, were possessed by demons. Bullshit. And I'm just going to say it just like that. Now, some of y'all might say, oh, but Beth, Mama Beth, how do you know it's bullshit? Maybe it's biblical. Well, it's not. Because I looked it up. <laughs> you know, one of the great things about this age is that uh, my Bible's online. I have the Bible out. And I can find anything I want. <laughs> So tell me now there were here's just seven Bible figures and I'm not wanting to get this all into preaching. Y'all know I don't preach on here. I'm a Christian, but and I believe God brings us uh what we need when we need it, hopefully if we if we listen. But uh first of all the Bible does not use the word depression. It uses downcast, broken hearted, troubled, miserable, despairing, mourning, among others. Okay, now let's Let's talk about some people who had depression, real depression. David. Y'all remember David? David David didn't always walk a straight path. David what didn't always live a happy life. Um and yes they will. Trolls are just assholes that have, have no joy in their life and they want to they want to bring misery to others because it gives them power. Uh so always just delete a troll. If you have a if you have a channel and somebody's leaving you ugly messages, delete, 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 delete. Block them if you're on a live stream. You don't have to, you don't have to listen to any of that. You know, they're, they're just there to make you miserable, to make them feel better. Okay, let's talk about David. Uh, in the Bible, he had a lot of guilt. He had huge grief in the loss of his son. Now this is 2 Samuel 12, 15 through 23. Mama Bear, if you're listening, and you probably are, and if you're not now, you will later, you need to look this up. This is, in other places, David's honesty was his own weakness to give hope to us who struggle today. Okay, he said, this is Psalms 38, 4, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. And then in 42, 11, he said, Why are you downcast, O oh, my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will pr yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now, he was begging. If you read this entire this entire set of verses, the whole chapter, you'll see that he was he was begging and he had guilt. And at times, he was suicidal. Was he possessed by demons? David, really? Father did? No. 
he was having a hard time and he was having situational depression. He got through it. Okay, now Elijah. He had spiritual victories. This is this is the best. Oh, she's live streaming tonight. Well, letters. I swear. Y'all should go over there and tell her that I'm talking about her. Maybe she'll shut up. Come over here and leave Wendy alone. Okay. Um, Elijah was discouraged and afraid after great spiritual victories over the prophets of Baal. This mighty man feared God of God feared and ran for his life far away from the threats of Jezebel. And he said, and this is the verse, I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am not better than my ancestors. That's 1 Kings 19, 4. He literally was suicidal. Was he possessed by demons? No. Okay, Jonah. We all know the story of Jonah. Okay, we know that Jonah was in a whale. That's the biblical verse. We now know that it probably wasn't a whale, which was a big fish. Um, but why was he there? Well, the reason was that he didn't want to preach to the people of Nineveh. And so he fled as far as he could. And he got on the ship. And God sent a storm, swept him overboard. And instead, it, he preached, he ended up preaching. And he said, Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for, for me to die than to live. That's Jonah 4 3. And even after God reached out to Jonah again with great compassion, he responded, I am angry enough to die. That's Jonah 4 9. You'll notice in here, he says, I'm angry enough to die. Have you ever noticed that uh, in our anger is depression? Or in our depression is anger. We're, we're mad that life perhaps isn't going. Yeah, she's the whale. She's the whale poop. Um, that's awful. <laughs> I'm going to hell, according to her, so I don't care. Um, I don't think I'm going to hell by my own by my own understanding and uh, by by the teachings mm -hmm. I've had. But uh, yeah. Anyway, the the fact of the matter is, anger and depression and sadness and guilt they all come together. And once we get to the root of it, then we can control the depression. Okay. Now, I don't know if any of you all have fathers who are masons and uh. Like, my dad was in the Masonic Lodge. He's been in it all my life. My mother's an Eastern star. I'm an Eastern star now. But they have a group for the boys and the girls. The girls' group is called Job's Brothers. And it teaches patience and kindness and uh, filial obedience. And it's a sorority, basically. And it's all based based on, uh, you know, Christian beliefs. It's based on the Bible. But Job, who was the most, remember, the most favored? Of God, Job said, "Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb?" That's Job three eleven. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. Job three twenty six. I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. That's Job ten eleven. Terrors overwhelm me. My life ebbs away. Days of suffering grip me. Night pierces my bones. My gnawing pains never rest. Job 30, 15 through 17. Job was the least possessed, possibly possessed man in the Bible. Remember? Other than Christ. I mean, he was the favorite human. So this nonsense about being suicidal and depressed and being in the means you've got demons. That's bullshit. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. And I'd say that to a minister. And we're all sinners. We're all sinners. The thing is, do we take accountability and correction for our sins, correct? And, uh, <laughs> Gustavo, that's, that's, do you see what I see? A whale, a whale, crashing from the sky with a tail as big as a kite. I'm thinking I hit the right, is that the right verse? Your grandfather was in the Masons, got really high in the ranks, but learned some scary stuff and left real quick. Well, I don't know what Masons he was in, but um, the ones, I mean, all the order, order that I'm in, it's all about charity and giving and being good people. And, uh, you know, but they, they'll, they don't tolerate, you know, anyone who isn't honest, honest in their business practices and things like that. And that's one of the reasons that I really, I really enjoy being in it. I like 
I like being a part of it because, um, you know, it's all about it's all about learning about God and worship and uh, being a good person and being responsible for yourself, individual. But Cynthia, thank you for coming, doll baby. But um, you know, so we know that depression has been going on since well before. The days of Christ. It's written about in the Bible. Now we know that the Bible, different parts of the Bible were different, get written different times and many different people wrote it. But, um, you know, it's been concurred upon and, uh, you know, agreed upon by many different, many different Christian sects. And so what I'm saying is depression happens and it doesn't, it, it's not some spiritual, you know, possession thing, scary thing. Oh no, he'll never tell you. But, uh, it's it, it's something that we deal with in different parts of our lives, and we can come out of it. You don't have to be depressed for the rest of your days. You can you can get through depression and get healthy. Now, I want to talk about um, I want to talk about the scientific scientific aspect, and there are many more people in the Bible who talk about depression. By the way, um, it's more than just seven. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Let's talk about the science behind depression because you know everything that happens in our body has a chemical. Uh, it, it's chemically started. It's it's based on our brain chemistry. It's brain. It could be you know different hormones, different different things that are going on in our body. We talked uh, one time about how you know your thyroid can make you seem like you're bipolar. Uh, it can give you great anxiety if you have graves, or you know you could be. You know, you can be hypo. It, it, if you have hypothyroidism, you can gain weight. You're tired. You can't move, and you think you you may feel 100% like you have depression. And if you don't have the blood work done, uh, it does not parallel Satan's rituals. I promise. <laughs> no, no, that's just what people say that don't know what they're talking about. I promise. Um, because I've been through all of it, and no, I wouldn't have anything to do with anything like that. Um. So besides, Satanism wasn't invented until 1930s, and uh, you can go and research that. But um, yes, please donate to the Les Laptop Funds. <laughs> and yes, thyroid storm. <laughs> my dogs are going crazy. They're probably going to let my bunny outside. I'm okay, okay, enough, enough. I said enough. Honey, you're going to have to come get them. He's probably asleep on the couch because he's worked all day. But you have to graves, only slightly graves. <laughs> Thank God love your heart. Did you lose a lot of weight with it? Because usually that's the first sign. Your eyes start to bulge a little bit and you start dropping weight like nuts. And, and, and then you get like jittery. I have thyroid storms. So I will go between being exhausted and then this is before I was treated being exhausted and then being so jittery and nervous i'd be just like blah, 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 blah. yeah so you did okay well i hope uh you have the um iodine treatment the radioactive iodine treatment where they give you the pill and then you go into you have to be quarantined for i think two days and then they come back and they check and they make sure basically they just kill your thyroid you don't need it you can take the medicine for it and uh you can take your synthroid every day and once they get your levels right you're going to feel a lot better yeah you Shaky, cried over everything. Oh my God. My mom had graves. Okay. Talk about my mom a lot. Oh, she has MPD, but, um, she also has graves. And when she was, when she first got graves, I thought, God, she's getting so skinny, but her eyes are just like popping out of her head. Now, my mother has always had big eyes. She's got big blue eyes. They're turquoise colored. It's a very odd color. At, Patients would actually say um, it was the nurse with the turquoise eyes because <laughs> they'll say who who checked you in or who did this. That's the nurse with the big turquoise eyes. Well, so she's always had this, but this was probably about 15 years ago, maybe. I don't know. I can't keep up with it. Um, but her eyeballs started looking like golf balls coming out of her head. And I'm like, Mom, what is wrong with you? You're losing all this weight. You need to go have your thyroid checked. Well, because I'm her daughter and she doesn't listen to anything I say, <laughs> she said, I'm fine. I've just been on a diet. She has not been on a diet. Well, I talked to, at the time, he was my GP and he's her GP and they're best friends. 
and it can't tell her nothing anyway. Half the time she'll listen, half the time she won't. But I told him, I said, Jim, you're going to have to, you've got to check mom's thyroid. She's lost all this weight. She's acting crazier than normal, and her eyes are coming out of her head. Could you please see if she's got grace? And, you know, and he, he mentioned it to her. He saw her at work at the hospital, and um, he said, I think we need to check the thyroid. And sure enough, she had grace. Oh, she made a huge deal of it. I'm like, Mom, I got how she made us. It's not that big a deal. Everybody in our family's got thyroid disorder. Um, in fact, my dad's father, uh, no relation to her, but my dad's father was the first one to receive radioactive iodine treatment in Virginia. He was he had to go all the way from southwest Virginia to Richmond to get it checked and to get it done. And uh, he was six six and he had dropped down to like 150 pounds. He had lost so much weight. I see, put a cancer survivor. She's had thyroid cancer. And um and now now that everybody is on their synthroid and uh they're starting to do better, people are starting to act a little bit better. Most people are starting to act a little bit better. But I know that when I I went like two months without having my thyroid medication and I was miserable to live with. I mean I can be either a joy or I can be a pain in the ass. But during that time, I was so snappy to everybody. People were like, you're not acting like yourself. And when other people are telling you, hey, there's something wrong, then you need to listen. Yeah. Just like with with depression, um, if you're not feeling right, if you're... If you know that you're sad and there's no reason behind it, it's time to go see a doctor. And the way you do this, um, yeah, the puppies demand the right to be heard. They, they think they're the stars of the show. They're over there now sitting in my, sitting in my really expensive antique chairs acting like kings. I'm very happy about it. <laughs> you don't need any meds for a year after the ablation. Oh, okay. You didn't need any. Oh, that's good. Well, it must have, you must have been really high and then they came down slow. Is that what happened? I've got chairs over there that are worth a small fortune and these dogs are just sitting on them licking each other. There's better kids. They're worse than kids. I could yell at my kids and they'd listen. <laughs> but, Okay, let's go into, uh, and, and once again, please hit the thumbs up, um, hit share, cause my Twitter's screwy, so if you'll share the, um, if you'll share the, the stream, I'd really appreciate it, that, that would make me very happy, and, um, if my teeth look quieter and my skin looks a little brighter, it's cause I got a ring light, um, I finally figured out how to use it, it only has to be 25 feet away, because it's really bright, okay, um, Let's go into the science behind depression. So uh, if you want to take notes, you can take notes. Now, the ancient Greeks believed depression was a result of a fluid imbalance. They believed that there were diff different fluids and humors in the body, and they believed that blood, phlegm, and yellow and black bile were what needed to all be in balance, which is kind of interesting because they were getting on that, you know, they were starting to learn that there are scientific things in our body that cause us to do different things. They were they were starting to hit on modern medicine. They still had a lot of crazy ideas, but um, you know they were starting to hit on okay, maybe the fluids do something, maybe uh, the brain does something. They had it mixed up in a lot of ways, but they were hitting on something. Okay, then early Christianity just said, "Ah, oh, the heck with all that medicine. It's just devils." Let me see what that got us. Okay, then the Renaissance rolled around and scholars like Richard, Robert Burton, I always say Richard Burton, uh, Robert Burton began to recognize that depression was actually a disease and a disease meaning there was something wrong in the body. Something can affect the body wrong. Like um, a cold is a disease. Is a disease. Uh, the flu is a disease. Depression is a disease. You know, it doesn't have to be something so serious as, uh, you know, like diabetes or pancreatitis or something like that. But depression is a malfunction of a part of the body. Now, if a part of the body, 
that's what we had to figure out. So uh, they started doing some testing on the chemicals and chemical imbalances, and they found out that low levels of serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter, 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 and it's responsible for all of your happiness. It's your feelings of elation and your joy. You know that when you had a lot of serotonin in your body, you felt really good. And people who are really depressed had really low levels of that. And um, yeah, it is. It's a trial and error. But you have to. The thing is, we have to keep open minds. And the Greeks had open minds, but then the Christians kind of closed it. So um, they were like, no, 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 no. And but then when we got to study again, we were like, aha, serotonin. If you have a lot of it, you feel good. If you don't have any much of it, you feel like crap. Uh, and you're depressed. So they started feeding depression patients drugs filled with serotonin. And some of them started to feel better. So they thought they had it all figured out. They didn't. Um, they started taking a closer look and realizing that there was actually something wrong with the hippocampus. Now, if you've seen my other videos where I explain what the amygdala and the hippocampus and the hypothalamus and all of that is, Different parts of your brain control different things, different emotions, uh, different abilities, whether it's your ability to think, to reason, to, uh, you know, your cognitive developments, your memories, your ability to breathe. You know, all your brain has all these really cool things. We don't know what it all is yet. We're still mapping it out. But um, we knew that the hippocampus was irregular. It was a regular shape with people who had you know, depression without cause, clinical depression. So, and now if you look in the brain and I hope you all Google and you look, it's kind of a seahorse shaped uh, stru structure and um, it handles memory and emotion. And it tended to be misshaped and smaller in people who had severe depression. I'm talking severe, severe depression. Uh, even worse, the longer they were depressed, the smaller the hippocampus shrunk in size ultimately limiting its ability so what we want to do what they found out is if they stimulated the growth of the hippocampus campus with new neurons patients were happier and healthier now you can do this um you can do this on your own when you're depressed if you can even find one thing to laugh about it increases the neurons in the hippocampus if you can find a reason to smile the more you smile the more you're going to smile. It's it's really like uh, it's like training yourself. You know how an athlete, if you can't run very well at all, like you know, I ran around as a kid, but I never did track. First day of track about killed me. It was eighth grade. They made us run the steps. They made us run around. They made us do sprints. I couldn't walk the next day. Most of my friends couldn't walk either. Then we learned that we had to do it slowly. We couldn't do it all full out. We couldn't make it, we couldn't run like we've been running for 10 years. And what we needed to do was start running a little bit. And those muscles started enlarging and our stamina built up. And we learned how, we learned how to hold our breath right, to breathe in and breathe out, in through the nose, out through the mouth. We learned what to do when a sprint came along. It's the same way with our brains. It is the same. If you are in a depressive state, you know, I want you to first see your GP, then go get a reference for a psychologist, okay, and see a therapist. Now, you may, a, a psychiatrist and then a therapist, um, your GP may say, you know what, I can put you on an antidepressant, but that's not going to help with your therapy. Your therapy is basically like what I'm doing with you now. Um, your hippocampus must have run away from home. You know what? If you if you've been depressed for a long time, it may be very very small. You may need to really work on building it up, kind of like lifting weights, you know. And you start out, and that's where the therapy comes in. Medicine can only do too much, so much. Medicine will give you your serotonin. Medicine will give you that, so you will have the ability to find joy in things. But what you have to do is. Whether it's, um, say you like to play the piano when you were little, but you haven't played the piano in years. Okay, so you find someone with a piano or a church that'll let you play. Or you go buy one of those little keyboards for 50 bucks. You know, shoot, you can get it for $25 on some of those yard sale sites. And you plug it in and you start playing. And you find 
find some joy in that, right? And then you start playing more pieces. The same way as you learn to play the piano, your joy comes back in. Or maybe you like to sing and you haven't sung in years. I know so many people who had beautiful voices, but because they got busy with job and kids and taking care of a house and a home and a husband or a wife, they don't sing anymore. They don't even listen to music. Okay, so you know you're depressed. Turn that happy music on that you used to sing with. And even if it's just listening to it at first, then you start singing with it a little bit. Put it in the bathroom. Sing in the shower. You know? That's that's a start. ECT? Okay, um, we could do a whole show on ECT. ECT is not what you see in the movies. You know, if uh, you watched American Horror Story, where they were in Berkeley, they did ECT on her. They, ha I was so mad because they misrepresented that. Um, yes, they did it in the old fashioned way. Marlette, would you shut up? I'm talking. This is not your conversation. This is mine. Um, they held Sarah Paulson down. She was the news reporter, and they held that. They held the the probes on her forehead until it literally burned her skin, and they held it on there for entirely too long. This is not how it works. This is not how it works right now. Um, they give you an anti-seizure medication, usually Valium, uh, because it relaxes you. And all, all they want to do, it's kind of like rebooting a computer. Okay? You know how when you reboot the computer, it starts all over again and it starts acting right and doing right? But you might lose a little bit of memory. You might might you know have a few frags here and there or whatever they're called it's the same with that that's the best way that i can explain it okay usually you're put under they they give you something to make you very sleepy so you'll sleep um it's they don't put you like under full anesthesia they don't want to do that they want your brain to be working and basically they go and it gives you a little bitty seizure okay in the frontal lobe through the temporal lobe to the frontal lobe and what that seizure does is a reset. All a seizure is is your brain going, oh, shit, this side's not working at the same pace as this side. So it has a seizure. That's what epilepsy is. This is a really simplified way. It goes, Zip, and, you know, you go, uh, or if you're in a petty mall, you might stare. If you're in a grand mall, you might fall down. You might have, a, you know, shake, jerk. It can be of all levels. But it's, a seizure is basically a reset to the brain. Marlette, hush. So, <laughs> make me pay myself. Um, ACT is a last resort when, when we can't get a patient who's really trying and who's been in therapy and who's tried every kind of, you know, SRI, SSRI, you know, you name it, lithium, from lithium, lithium's a natural, um, antidepressant. Um, all the way through when we try everything and nothing is working and the person is not only having depression but they could be uh bipolar uh schizophrenic um when it's basically we can't get the chemicals to straighten themselves out so we use a series you never get just one you get series of them and they're not painful you're just very sleepy and groggy the next day and uh you're probably going to lose a little bit of memory um that's okay. There's some memories I want to lose, frankly. Um, but I have seen people who have had too many who had to learn how to use the vacuum cleaner again. Um, they lost those memories. It's very odd to think about that. They uh, forgot how to brush their teeth. But they had been through hundreds because they were so suicidal and so sick that there was nothing. But we didn't... The, their doctors, I wasn't involved in that, but, uh, you know, I saw the patient after, but it kept her alive. And you know what? That was, she probably had all of those ECT treatments done, all those sessions 25 years ago, but now she's in a new marriage. Um, she knows how to do everything. She is able to take care of herself. She's able to cook, drive. Do everything that we want to do. Um, you know, I, I was really proud and, but it was hard for her. But you know, 
we have to weather the storm to get through to the rainbows. And she was going to be dead if she didn't get help. Um, oh, Rev, you come back and see us. So my, uh, my baby, you just come on back. They put your daughter on Prozac, Sandy. Oh, good. It's, I am so glad that she's feeling better. Let me tell you, Prozac, a lot of people had a lot of crap to say about Prozac, but it works. It works for a lot of people. Prozac, Paxil, mm. I'll, I'll suggest that, you know, they'll say, well, what's the newest medicine? And they'll say, oh, the two. I'm like, that's an antipsychotic. You have depression. Why are you on that? You're not delusional. You're not having any kind of fixations. You don't need that. You need an antidepressant. Let's try you on Prozac. You know, the, the main problem with Prozac is it, it made people happy and they ate. You know? <laughs> so, you know, unless they were had some weird allergy to it, you know, a lot of these, a lot of those beginning drugs that came out in the late 80s and early 90s, God, they were good, and they're still good. And oh, your daughter has epilepsy. It's I, what is she on for epilepsy? And then when I had a seizure, I dislocated both sides of my jaws because they couldn't get them back. I talked like a bulldog. You know what happens with that? Um, hang on, just a second. I had to just look at Joel one time. Just I, I was helping a girl do a backflip, and I was teaching dance, and she dislocated night before Thanksgiving. My luck. Anyway, they could not get it to settle. They, I mean, they had the X-ray to solve where it was dislocated. They did the whole thing, but they were trying to knock it back in. Well, the problem was they tried so many times that my jaw was swelling up, and the muscles were were stretched and you know damaged so it took like a week for me talking like this because i literally i mean i was bandaged but they bandaged me for a while but um i couldn't talk and then when it finally went down and i've been on enough medication to where it helped it go down that they popped it in that hurts and then it swelled again and i couldn't talk for a while after that but I'm rather talkative, so I think I gave everybody a break. <laughs> but it's hard teaching and going to school and, you know, working a job and being a mom when you can't talk. <laughs> Reva, I want you to come back in, definitely. But, um, you know, and please go up to, you'll see where it says Megan's blog, and it's the last laptop sign. Now, there are three reasons that we're doing this. And this is so funny. We were talking about this last night. I woke up to pee and could not go back to sleep. So I checked on Les, which I always do because I usually sleep. I try to sleep through the night. I take Balsamra and that helps. But if I wake up, I check on her because I want to make sure she's all right. And I don't know. I, I guess it's funny. She's three years older than me, but I feel I feel very protective of her. And, uh, but I do with my friends. I'm very protective of my friends. Um, but I checked on her and Mama Bear had been apparently just giving everybody a piece of her raunchy mind. And she had yelled at everybody from Katie to Joe to Liz to, uh, little Rosie to uh, people who were giving her $5. She was like, you should have given me more than $5. You know, talk about being <laughs> ungrateful. Anyway, so, um, I think it, it, we had a troll. There was a troll that came in that was just real ugly. It said, she just had a fundraiser. Blah, blah, blah. Well, yes, yeah, she did. She got her sight back, but now she's going to get her freedom back. And, uh, it was, it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful live stream. <laughs> Ash, Ash has some numbers and, uh, Hal Suey at the end, which cracks me up because that's how we called the pigs and the, and the cows. Um, Anyway, she said, you know what? We ought to do a fundraiser just to, just to piss her off. And um, Les said, okay. You know, because she really does. She earns our budget very, very tight. And uh, this is going to help her get back to work. It's also help, going to help her with socializing and having her games and things like that. So <laughs> it was threefold. Help her game, piss Mama Bear off, and uh, help her go back to work. <laughs> We raised five hundred dollars in an hour and a half, and the goal is fifteen hundred. 
So if you can find it in your heart to send five dollars, I promise she won't yell at you like <laughs> like the other one will. <laughs> oh lordy. Okay, um, let's see. I've got twelve watchers. Woo! <laughs> You know what? I'm happy for every single person. I'm going to get some more to drink here. Okay. I'm drinking Diet Coke, y'all. I coffee this morning and I'm starting to get a headache. Um, does anyone have any questions? Like how we, how we work with? We're talking about stress and anxiety. And we've been talking about... These dogs are driving me crazy. Um, we've been talking about depression. And I'd like to move on to anxiety. Does anyone have any questions? Hush! Hey! Hey, 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 you're being rude. You're being very rude. You can't do that. You need to be quiet. And no, you're not getting on screen, you little booger. Um, if anyone has any questions, I know. They, they, it's it's like a three ring system here. It is, yes. You're just a rotten dog. Rotten doggy. Come here. You want you want to come in? Say hi. All right, this is Spanky. Come here. You're so heavy. They're fat. He's fat. This is Spanky. Say, I'm a full, full dapple. <laughs> and I love them. But, and Marlott's over there. Marlott's, Marlott's kind of being a butt. Quit growling at your brother. Go on. Go on. But if you have a uh, honey, listen, we need to have one for you. I apologize. Hey. Hold on just a second. I'm going to mute my mic and yell at my husband to come get these blooming dogs. Hold on just a second. I apologize. I had to scream at my husband to come get these dogs. The dogs are like, we don't want to go. <laughs> silly, silly, silly. Okay. Um, Sandy, honey, we need to have a GoFundMe for you because I know that you are you are having such a hard time. Um, you know, if if there's whatever you want to do, you let me know. You've got my contact information. If you don't wrangle these dogs, I'm going to throw them. My mom piece is like, ah. <laughs> So she says, I feel bad for my new therapist. We talked about trauma, and I was so angry I yelled at her. I feel like I should apologize. Do you think she understands? Of course she understands. Let me tell you, if I expected an apology every time somebody call, called me a bitch or cussed me or cried or yelled at me, I'd be getting uh, I'd be getting letters in the mail every day because it happens every single day. Okay, it is normal. Did you get them all? Get downstairs, Marlon. Downstairs, go with Daddy. Offer them food or something. I don't know. Throw them out the door and let them come into the kitchen. Keep them down there. Oh, it's raining. Winters don't go out when it rains. They melt. Kind of like the wicked witch. Um. Well, hi, Ben Howard. You've been just suffering from depression. I also have had a stroke. My name is Bonnie. Well, hello, Bonnie. Um, we're talking about, so she yelled at her therapist. You know what? That is a breakthrough. When, because when we have depression, we have anxiety because we're always worried that our depression is going to affect someone else or that, you know, we're going to run people off. And there's all these crazy thoughts. Listen, when you have depression, people still love you. And that, and we forget that, but that's part of it. Um, but we're angry as well because we don't like what the situation we're in, right? You yelled at her 
because you were frustrated and you needed to get it out. That's what she's there for. Okay. And now that you've gotten that out, the next one say, you know, I, I would go in and I'd say, I yelled at you and I'm sorry. I needed to get that out, but thank you for listening. Thank her for it. And Bonnie, um, if you have any questions or if I'm hanging on anything that, uh, you know, you feel like touches you, then speak up in the chat. I'm very happy to talk about it. Okay. Uh, Sandy. Yeah, well, Susie, you're going to feel worse after, but you're going to feel better later, I promise, because you needed to get that out. These dogs will not listen to their daddy at all. He puts them downstairs, they come right back up. I swear you're going to have to lock them in the bedroom. Put them upstairs in the bedroom. Wow, what are they going to do? Well, either that or lock them one at a time in the den with you. He keeps carrying, it's, this is like you. It's something out of the Asian stable. He carries one down and puts it down. Then he comes back and gets another and puts it down. And then the next one. And then by the time he's got the third one down, the other two escape. But um, you're sick and you can't work. You can't get disability or SSI. We need to work with you. I can help you with that. Um, when my Twitter works, or you can email me. You know, you can always email me. Um, I'm trying to get my Twitter to work again. I don't know what, why it's locked me out. It's never done that before, but it's been acting crazy. We'll talk about that. And, um, I help patients, you know, different ones. We go through the disability process and see what we can do. Okay. Come get him. And I'll, I'll be more than happy to help. Um, you know, Putin's going through the same thing. Her money's tight, and you know, Sandy, we want you have to, you have to have food to eat. You know, and you took care of your mom for all those years. So I, I don't know if you all know this, but Sandy's mother uh, had Alzheimer's, and she took care of her for five years. And um, her mother's check that came in was all they had to live on. Well, then when she was forced to put her in a nursing home, they took that. So Sandy has been basically living, you know, hand to mouth. And I would like to do something, you know, put together a fundraiser, do something for Sandy. And we'll see what, what we can figure out um, if we can set her up with PayPal uh, to her bank. And uh, we want to we wanna make sure that she has enough to eat. And if I have to send you money, I'll do it. You know, I'll, I'll do whatever I have to, have to do to make sure I'm not going to let you starve. You know, and it's, it is, it, you know, we go through so much and then we think we're heading to the, to the end, right? We think we're getting to the final countdown and we're like, ah, oh, it's going to be easy from now on. And then crap happens. That can set you back emotionally. And, you know, you're not sure where to go. Honey, are you getting him? Okay. Thank you. Um, Hi, Chloe girl. Well, thank you, Steve. We will. I, I know. See, Sandy, Sandy explained on one of the live streams, and I think it was my last one. I was sick last weekend. I don't know if you all know, I have fibromyalgia. I think everybody has fibromyalgia. But um, I have rheumatoid arthritis, and I have a lot of autoimmune disease. Um, hereditary. I drew the short straw. But um, when I have a flare, my face gets really, really red, and I get really, really tired, and my hands swell up, my feet swell up. That's what happened last Saturday. So I didn't get to have a live stream. But normally I have my live streams on Saturdays at 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock we talk about domestic violence and abuse. And if you or anyone you know is suffering from that, please, please, please come to this channel Saturday at 1 o'clock. Hopefully my Twitter will be back up, and then I can... You can follow me on Twitter and you'll get your notifications that way as well. Then at uh, I go from one to three and we talk about domestic abuse and violence. And then from four until six, we talk about mental health. Now, mental health covers all of this. We I leave, I'm leaving this open for anyone in the chat. If you want to talk about something that's affecting you personally, you know, something that's in your family. If you have a friend that's going through something, you want to learn more about it. 
I want to, I want this to be an open dialogue, you know, so we, we all have it, have it going on. Yeah. But if you go back to my last one, Sandy talks about the issues that she had taking care of her mother. Uh, Sandy was very, very sick. Sandy had had, I believe you'd had gastric bypass then. And then she also, and sometimes when you have gastric surgery, it can make autoimmune issues like fibro and RA and, you know, thyroid disorders and, you know, all that. It can make it worse. Well, that's what it did to her. And there were a lot of days that, you know, she was literally crawling to take care of her mother. So she needed as much help almost as her mom did. Then somebody turned her in for elder abuse. Now, she had taken care of her for five years, given up her life, given up her home to come and stay with her mother. Much like I did. I took care of my grandmother for four years. And it took a toll on Sandy's body, mind, body, emotions, that, that, you know, the whole gamut. And then to be accused of something like that. And of course, they found it was wrong. It was, it was all baloney, you know, but they did say that she needed more help and that it was more than you could do in a home and they wanted to put her in a nursing home, which, you know, I don't understand why why they always go to the nursing home first instead of taking care of someone in their own home. But um anyway, so Sandy Sandy has lost everything and she's sick. So that's you know, that breaks my heart. And she's dealing with she's dealing with depression and things like that. So we we want to all pitch in and help. You know, we want to make sure that that she gets enough to eat. You know, and that she's she's gonna have lots on. Uh, Chloe, I am so glad you're here. And, uh, Bonnie, I'm glad you're here. And you still go to court next month. You're going to win that. Absolutely, Steve. That's exactly what happened. Because, um, she, it was, she did not understand that her mom's retirement I believe it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sandy, that her retirement money still didn't go to Sandy because Sandy was her guardian and was, I guess, POA and was taking care of the home and everything. And she let them take her mother to the nursing home, but the nursing home wasn't even saying that it was a permanent placement, right? So the nursing home says, well, it's not a permanent placement, but we still want all your mother's money. Well, Sandy hadn't been able to work five years because she's been taking care of her mother. Guys, that fair? She has nothing. She spent her savings to take care of her mother. She spent her mother, because her mother's check doesn't go very far. I know that. Listen, I took care of my mother for four years. I was broke as hell when I was done. And if you said family help, no. They didn't buy groceries that they didn't, that they didn't demand money out of my grandmother's checking account or me to pay for it. And I paid the utilities. In that big house, you know, I, I paid the utilities. I uh, I had my car payment. I had the utilities payment. I had my insurance payment. I took, taking care of my daughter, everything she needed. And most of the time, I, you know, groceries because, you know, they were supposed to bring groceries once a week and all the list, but that didn't happen. So you end up, you end up paying your own money. And you can't bring any money in. So I hope you got plenty of saved. If you volunteer to take care of a relative, you better have a damn good amount of money in your savings account. And you better have people who will come in and help because I didn't. Um, nobody. Until the last year, nobody. I didn't even have an aide that would come in and help me. And all they did was change my grandmother's bed linen and give her a quick little bath. Well, I bathed her every day. I changed her bed linens every day. Wash her hair. I, I did all of that. I, I did all the laundry and all the cleaning. It wore me down. And I can see where, and I identify so strongly with what Sandy's going through. And now she's depressed. She's sick. And she's being taken to court. And it's not right. I know that after my grandmother passed away and I was, <sighs> I was trying to get myself back. I, I was kind of agoraphobic myself. So I forced myself to, you know, I got a job at a friend's restaurant waiting tables part time, which is crazy. I hadn't waited tables in ages, but I started doing that to kind of get myself out again and doing things again. And 
being around people again. And then, then I went back to work at, uh, the radio station actually called me and said, we heard you're looking for a job. I was like, yeah. So, you know, I was lucky that I was able to get a good job and to move out. But otherwise, I would have been in the same situation as Sandy. You know, all my savings gone, everything I'd worked for gone. I had given up my condo, you know, um, thank God I hang on, hung on to my car because uh, shit, the family would have said sell it. And they told me you could use, you could use your grandmother's car. Well, my aunt stole it. And that's another thing. But, you know, I, I see where Sandy's coming from. She didn't get a dime in payment for taking care of her mother. And as a, as a daughter or a granddaughter, we think, you know, that's our duty. That's family duty. You know, we don't want, we don't want our loved ones in a nursing home. But then again, that's prime time in your life that you're to be earning and putting money back and, you know, putting your 401k and your, you know, your social security and things like that. And if you're not disabled, you know, in one way or another, you're screwed. Because you're just they if if they take your family member and put them in a nursing home and they tell you to get the hell out of the house, what are you gonna do? You have no money. No money, no job. And it takes a little while to get a job. And if you're sick, it takes even longer. You know, I'm I was lucky enough to where I had a good reputation with within the media market. Everybody knew I did sales and everybody knew what my track record was. It's radio stations all know each other. It's like a family. So they knew everywhere I'd work. They knew my set, my track record. So I literally didn't even have to apply at the, at, at the stations for them to hire me. And, you know, they called me up. I was like, how to get my number? <laughs> but it was, I was very blessed in that, but not everybody is. And then Sandy's car broke down. She can't see her mother. So, you know, we need to get Sandy back on her feet. And, you know, I want to help Les get her laptop. But I'd like to help Sandy get on her feet so she get her. We need to find out how much it's going to be to fix her vehicle. And Sandy, um, I know we're doing little Rosie's telethon. I'm doing that with Uber and I'm donating to that this uh, weekend. Everybody. If you don't know who Uber Goober Lady is, she's a doll baby, and she's raising money this Saturday. Now, we're doing Les for her laptop. Please donate. The links are in the in the chat. Um, but Uber is having a fundraiser on Sunday, and you can bid on things. I put some jewelry up for auction. That's nice. I've got some pieces that are less expensive, and then I've got some, some that will cost you some money. But uh, they're all for a good cause. So to pay for little Rosie's chemotherapy treatment, um, her med she's got cancer and her medication is ridiculously expensive. So we're trying to help her with that. I hope that after we do this, that we keep the charitable spirit going. And I'm going to talk to uh, some people and we'll see if we can't get Sandy some money raised. If just to get her her vehicle running. So she can visit her mother, so she can go put in job applications, so she can get get back on her face. Okay, that's what I want to see happen. Bonnie says I have memory issues and vascular dementia from brain injury from stroke. I have to go. My phone rang and I need to talk to them. Thank you, Bonnie. I would love to have you come up on the panel. If you will uh, send me an email, my information is in the description box. Please send me an email. It's mamabethsworld at gmail.com. And tell me a little bit about your story. And uh, we will talk. And I'd love to have you come up and share. And, you know, we can all learn from what's going on. Okay. Uh, and she may have already left. I may have read this too late. But if anybody knows Bonnie, uh, please. Get in touch with her and tell her that I'd love to have her on the panel and it's give me an email. Anyone who wants to email, it's mama best world, just like the channel at gmail.com. And all of my information is in the, is, uh, in my description box. So I'm really easy to find. 
amazing. <laughs> but I'm easy to find, and uh, I usually Twitter is the easiest way to get me. But Twitter's being a butthole right now, and it's locked me out. I don't know why. It's been doing that to about everybody. But um, you know, Sandy, she she does need her chemotherapy medication. She is in a critical position. Yes. But you need help too. And if it's, you know, $500 to get your car fixed, we can do that. You know, God knows I've got enough stuff to, to offer up for auction that we can, we can do that. Okay. Um, you're considered terminal. See, and you should be getting, then you should be getting SSI or SDI, SSDI. You know, that's that's the thing. You know, if you're terminal, then you you need to have the help. And, you know, it's it breaks my heart that you're worried about having a dollar and 89 cents for hot dog buns. You know, I have been there with having no money. Now, I haven't been there and sick at the same time. You've got it piled on you. But, um... I don't want anybody to go hungry. I, I just, I, I can't, I can't abide that. You know, what, I'm one of those people that if, if I get asked in a, you know, at a convenience store or outside or whatever for somebody, you know, can I have $5? I haven't eaten. We do it. Because then, and, and I don't care if they buy food and people say, oh, they're going to buy beer. Okay, whatever. That's their choice, but mine is I hear a hungry person, and I can't, I can't let somebody go hungry when I've got a few dollars in my pocket, and uh, the lawyers won't touch it. You can do it on your own, and I'll teach you how to do it. I, uh, I've helped people get disability with no lawyers. And that's just the truth. Yeah, no one should be hungry in this day and age. But Sandy, I will uh, email me and my lipstick's going everywhere. Email me and I will I will help you. You don't need a lawyer. You need disability, but you need to apply for it yourself. And you don't need a damn lawyer. Lawyer just take thirty three percent of what you're getting. Her problem is she can't even get to a food pantry. That's the thing. That's what I'm thinking. You know what, Sandy? Since you can't really get out, but you got an address, if nothing else, um, I'll get you your points for an out for disability. Well, we'll see what happens. Let me see. Let me see what I can do. There are people I can talk to, and uh, but if nothing else, Sandy, we will get. I will get your address, and you can go on Walmart. I don't know exactly where you live, but you know you can go on Walmart.com and the uh, you can order all sorts of food. You can order everything from granola bars to these uh, mac and cheese. Um, I don't think you can get regular milk, but you can get powdered milk. Um, and you can get juices. You can get canned fruits, can anything canned or boxed. That they can put together and they can ship it to you. Why don't we? Um, hi, Lynn. Um, what we can do is we can put together. If you'll, we'll, I'll help you, and we'll put together a Walmart wish list and uh, get you some groceries together, and we'll have it shipped to you. Okay. And I'll be in charge of that. I would be very happy to do that. You know, because you're you're not able to get out and drive. Your car's messed up, and you're sick. You can't work. But we're not gonna let you starve. Okay, so just send me an email and because unfortunately about this time of night, it's 9.30 here, about this time of the night, I, I tend to forget things because <laughs> I'm tired, but um, send me that, I'll get it and I'll help you get it set up for on Walmart and Walmart delivers within a day, sometimes two, but usually a day, they're really fast. And you can get everything that you need. Now, I don't know if Amazon Prime is in your area. I do have an Amazon Prime account. And we can put it on that. And I can have it sent to you. So, um, 
and there are i'm sure there are other yeah other things it's toilet paper paper towels they deliver all that shit that is i'm telling you okay i kept running out of shampoo and y'all know i have a thing about toilet paper or maybe i haven't told it to you i want at least two rolls of toilet paper in every bathroom i have three bathrooms in this house three full-size bathrooms i want toilet paper in every one and my husband he doesn't understand that after nine years that i need him to buy several huge packs of toilet paper because i have a fear i don't know why it's an irrational fear of running out of toilet paper isn't that silly but um yeah i got froggy a while back and i ordered a bunch of toilet paper like you know the great like the biggest packs i think i ordered two cases we didn't toilet paper for a long time it was really nice but you can order everything you can order uh soap you can order cleaning supplies you can order your toilet paper your paper towels you can order every washcloths you can order bed linen we'll put together a list okay and um we'll get it sent to you get you taken care of and we need to see if amazon prime delivers in your area because sometimes they're a little cheaper but we will find which one okay and we'll get a list put together so um yeah sandy just tell me in detail what's going on and oh god yeah paper towels ooh, that just hurts you foodly and then it'll stop up the toilet yes i am <laughs> if if there's been inch of snow and and we get feet of snow that's do you see why i freak out we get like three and four feet of snow on this mountain and so i'm shitting bricks if i don't have toilet paper Paper towels I can go without. I don't like paper towels, I'll be honest with you. The only thing I the only thing I really want to use a paper towel for is to drain bacon. But because <laughs> I think they're a waste of money. Um, I want to use dish rags, dish cloths, you know, and that way I can throw them in my washer and I've still got it again. I'm not I'm not filling up the garbage can either. But um it's just a, it's a thing. It, Men only use, okay, men only use toilet paper once with one function, right? Unless they blow their nose. Um, so they can kind of go without, especially if they go to work to poop. And I know y'all do it. I know y'all do it. I have too many guy friends who say, I don't buy toilet paper. I poop, I poop at work. <laughs> I'm like, we can't do that. Girls can't do that. We, we, use it for both number one and number two so we have to have toilet paper and you know and i know guys who said yeah i, I don't have any toilet paper so just got in the shower and i thought you know if i get in the shower i get my hair wet and then i and i have hair down to my ass and somebody said they didn't realize that on camera too um, i said that's no you can't take that many showers a day i have to i have to be peace chick so i have to have toilet paper and i'm going to and if i don't i'll help so frankly <laughs> and Stay says mom and us men are just getting used to putting the lid down so give your old man a break <laughs> you know he's really good about lifting the lid and putting the lid down he was trained well he was raised in a house with a mother and two sisters so he was trained well on that i've never had to fuss at him about that um i don't think ever but um, but the toilet paper thing because when we were dating he would come to my house and he would say why do you have an entire thing of toilet paper and then you've got to two or three and i'm like because i have a fear of running out <laughs> oh target does it as well yeah walmart started a meal program but it's the, if you've ever done those meal programs they're expensive i mean real expensive We figured out that I could make two meals for the price of one meal. Like, um, and there's two of us. So that means there's four meals that I could have made with the cost that it makes. Um, and plus sometimes there's there stuff, the blue apron, and then there was another one that we used. It would come and like the tomatoes would have a spot on them or something would be a little wilted. And I'm like, I don't cook like that. I cook with fresh stuff. I cook from scratch i don't i'm not one of these people that buys box stuff 
I use real recipes of real ingredients and excuse me. And um, real me, we're not vegetarian around here. My daughter's a vegetarian. I have to pick vegetarian's crap when she comes. I just, I, basically, I just leave the meat out of everything, <laughs> everything she's going to eat. But, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's just, it's better if, if we do this for Sandy, she can pick out what she wants. And, um, and if she wants, and like their soup, you can get soups, you can get, um, I don't think you can get frozen stuff unless they offer that specifically in her area. They might. If they do, we can get frozen meats. But um, I'll figure out how I get meat there. You watch. But um, why don't I post that? Um, if my Twitter was working, <laughs> I would. If he piece chick, Twitter's mad at me. <laughs> Twitter's being an asshole. But, um, you know, that's the thing. I, I want to do that. And let's uh, let me get with Sandy. We'll find out everything that she needs and what her situation is. <laughs> I can't cook. I was like, you microwave, damn it. <laughs> I'll buy you a microwave, and uh, you can you can milk soup and you know whatever it is that you eat. And I know that she's had surgery, so she she has to watch what exactly she does eat. But we can do that. We can do this, and um, you know, I, and I'm doing it on this video. And then once my Twitter stops being a butthole, I will post it that we're going to help Sandy. And it won't be this Saturday, but it'll be next Saturday. And that I will get all the stuff together. And anybody who wants to donate can. And you can do it. If we do it through Walmart, they have Walmart gift cards. So if you want to just like donate $5 and put it on a Walmart gift card for her, that would be great. Um, oh, hell, I got an extra slow cooker. I'll just mail you. Shoot, we could, it, you know, we can, we can do this. And, you know, there is no one, no one in this world should ever have to go hungry. I've been hungry. Let me tell you, let me tell you a little story. Um, I had moved to North Carolina. I had just separated from my first husband. Now, I was working two jobs. I was uh, doing, a, trying to get a little house. I was trying to buy it. We were living in it. Oh, God, it needed a new HVAC system. I mean, it was just. It was a cute little house. It had air conditioning, but unfortunately no heat. And this was in Thomasville, North Carolina. And now I'm the kind of mom that I, I didn't want a bunch of men in my life. I wanted to spend all my time with my daughter. I wanted to go to work. I wanted to come home and be with my baby. That's She has always been my world. But I remember coming home and uh, we've been down there probably about six months. And they had cut my hours back on my second job. And I thought, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? My first job was just paying my, was paying my mortgage because I was doing a rent to own thing with this house. I don't know. I was young and I will never do that again. But to pay for, I had to pay my car payment. I had to pay for her daycare. I had to pay all, all of my regular bills. And my first job was paying that. And you know what? If I'd have had a husband that was making money, I would have been doing okay. We would have been fine. But I didn't. So I was working nights and I was doing the books for a pizza. Uh, it was a small family owned pizza chain. And basically I was just, you know, counting the registers, doing the books, you know, front, front to back. And I'm not even that good with numbers. I lied to get that job. I was like, oh yeah, I can do this. I've run my business and all this. Shit, I learned on my feet. But, and a lot of times I was real grateful to get an extra pizza that they had made by accident. My boss knew that I was struggling. And, uh, I would pay the babysitter in pizza. There were a lot of nights that Madeline and I had pizza. But it got, it got to where, you know, there was one week that all I could afford was a bag of potatoes. And I cried, you know, I, I went into the grocery store and I got the bag of potatoes and I thought, I've got butter at home, not that salt, what am I going to do? And I came home with that bag of potatoes and I thought, i got to make this last till Friday and it was like Monday. So I told Madeline, 
she's just sitting there. She's like three and a half. She's so cute. I said, guess what? She said, what? And I said, uh, hey, Randy. I said, uh, we get to eat baked potatoes. And she said, what? And I said, you know, we love baked potatoes. They are the best treat in the world. There are things that you do as a mother that are hard. But your kid will laugh about it later. She said, Mama, you had me thinking baked potatoes were the best thing in the world. And I said, yes. Yeah. So, but we made it. We made it to Friday. We made it to payday. And we did. Every evening she'd say, are we getting another baked potato? But yes, we are. Baked potatoes with butter and salt. And that was our dinner. Now she got to eat. She got to eat a good balanced meal at uh, her daycare. She got breakfast and lunch there. And they should have. They co It cost me a fortune to keep her in daycare. But it was the best one. And um, I wouldn't believe her with just anybody. I couldn't do that. So, you know, but we do things. And I know what it's like. I know what it's like to feel like you're, you have nothing and then to be hungry. So I lived on baked potatoes for years. So I've been there. It's, it's hard, isn't it, honey? It is hard. And I love baked potatoes still to this day, but I never eat one that I don't think about that. I never eat one. So I don't think about her sweet little face and that blonde hair. We get a baked potato. And then on special occasions during that time, we would get, I would go by the little Chinese place and they had, uh, pork fried rice. And I could get, I think, a pork fried rice for a buck and a half and split it between the two of us. And that would be our dinner. And I'd make iced tea. Y'all know in the South, that's what you drink. You don't drink soda. You drink iced tea. And, uh, that's how ramen is for me. You know, I know so many people who really, they lived on ramen, especially if they were college kids. Um, now my daughter never had to do that. You know, I've been through so much with struggling. I'll, you know, I won't go let her do it. I probably should have. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lesson that we learn. Uh, yeah, Steve, you think about that. Hi, Angie Gale, life over 50. I'll be there in three years, honey. I'm 47. I think I'm holding up good for 47. But, you know, I'm looking forward to my yeah, 50th birthday. I'm going to have a big blowout and I'm going to have it here at the house. Um, hopefully by then we'll have, uh, most of the things done that we want. Um, I've got some paint I need to do. The kitchen needs to be finished. God, that kitchen has turned into, ah, oh, seventh circle of hell. And um, because it, it, I'm just dealing with incompetence all the way around. But, uh, you know, and then I want the upper hallway painted and I want the um, the one bedroom needs to be painted, the one at the end of the hall. And then I want the den painted and I want shelves put in. So once, <laughs> hopefully in three years, we'll get all that crap done. And then what we want done outside, the last little landscaping. But, um, you know, I... Once I get that finished, I want to have a great big blood party. I always have birthday parties and, or we go on vacation and, uh, cause my baby, it's Labor Day. The whole world, the whole nation celebrates my birthday. And I have had birthday parties with two and three hundred people. And I shit you not. Um, it is, it, it, it's always fun for me. You know, my 40th vacation, we went to Miami, but, um, I mean, I've had vacations folks me from people that I have met online and then we all, like, 20 of us meet up and, and celebrate for the weekend. And it's, you know, I never had birthday parties as a kid, so I'm, I'm making up for it now. <laughs> but thank you about my lipstick shade. This is, um, Unicorn Blood and it's, uh, it's giving me butthole mouth as, uh, <laughs> as Raw Christie says. But um, if I put a little bit, it's getting older. That's why it's doing this. But if I put a little bit of, like, I use the Blissex chapstick stuff, and um, it won't do that. So it's real good. I'm in love with Jeffree Star. You come and visit me. You just come on. Oh, Dave, you're a hell of a liar. I love you. <laughs> I wish I didn't look a day over 30. Um, I'm real lucky with the wrinkles. 
uh, genetics and enough body fat to push them out, I guess. <laughs> but, oh, you just turned 51 on the 7th. Well, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Auntie Gail. Happy birthday to you. Everybody give her a clap. 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 Woohoo. Happy birthday. But I have red rum. I have red rum and I have Anna Nicole. I had Anna Nicole on earlier because I had a I had a blouse that had a little kind of an orangey red tone. Uh, red rum, I love. I got it because Katie wears it. Oh, you turn 31 on the 16th and feel 80. Oh, don't feel 80. <laughs> I'm 56, so I am old and dusty. No, you're not. You're not old and dusty, Steve. You know, I think, and ladies in here, you all tell me if you agree or not. I have never been attracted to 20-year-old men. Now, they're pretty. They can be on TV and they can have all the cut abs and stuff and all that nonsense. And that's fine. And when I was 20, I turned my head just like everybody else. But now that I'm 47 and I get to looking at men and I look at men of all ages, I wouldn't have a man under 40. And let me tell you why. A man under 40 doesn't have his shit together yet. A man under 40 is probably still contemplating his midlife crisis because he's getting ready to turn 40. A man at 40 has his job figured out, his morals figured out. He's done chasing tail most of the time if he's got any sense. He's figured out whether he wants to be a family man or not. Sometimes, sometimes men under 40 have already been married, had a couple of kids, figured out that maybe she wasn't right, but they like being daddy and they're good daddies or by 40, they, if they're bad daddies, they'll find out. But I would not go out with a man under 40 if I was single right now. Because 40 is when they're starting to blossom. They really are. And you know what? Physically, 40 is attractive. I mean, I look at 40-year-old men, late 30s, or, you know, early 40s. And the ones that take care of themselves and work out and run and lift weights. Ooh! Ooh! <laughs> ooh! You know, any, anything that's, that's under that, I'm like, you're not right yet. It's like heaven. <laughs> it's like a plum. Y'all ever had plums? You know, like, gr grew plums, had plum, plum trees? You know, Unripe plums still are purple. They're still dark bluish purple. But they're hard. And you've got to have a better eye and you've got to be around and versed in it to know that when you touch that plum, it's got to give a little bit. It's got, it, you want it fine, but you want it to give a little Cause you know that's the one that's sweet. That's the one that's right. Right? And that's the ones I would want. If I was, I wouldn't care if I was 20. I wouldn't date anybody under 40. I wouldn't care about the age difference. I'm going to tell you, when I was 27, I was dating a 64-year-old man. Treated me wonderful. He's the only one that treated me as well as my husband. And that's because he was fine. And he was good to me. He loved me. And I respected him. He was smart as a tack. And he didn't act 64 either. He was fun. He was so much fun. But yeah. So don't anyone, don't any of you fellas that say, oh, I'm 40, I'm over there, or oh, I'm 50. No, you just right. Y'all got sense. You, you are ready to take care of a family or a woman. Even if you don't want to have kids, you're good to your, good to your wives. You figured out that the bimbos with no brains, they droop. <laughs> Unless they've got a good plastic surgeon, everything drinks, you know, uh, from the hair to the boobs to the ass, it all will fall one of these days. And older men appreciate older women. They realize that, you know, even those of us who have had a little enhancement, that's where it is. Right here. And right there. So. <laughs> yeah. 35-year-olds are kids to me. 
I, I see people, I, I see 35 men and women, and I'm like, to me, they act, and not all of them, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna paint with broad brush, cause that's how you make a lot of mistakes. Um, I see some 35 year olds though that haven't got it figured out, and they haven't had to figure it out. And they really are on the maturity level of the generation before 25 year olds. And, and that's sad. And you can't, you, at 35, it's kind of hard to go back and learn those life lessons. And that's why we have to learn them. And that, that's why our teens are so shitty. People say, oh, your teenage years are your best years. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're the hardest years. You know, you have to learn everything. You're socially inept. And you're trying to figure it out and you're trying to grow up and you don't know whether you're a kid or an adult. Um, you, school is, you're like super stressed over school because you gotta do it, gotta do it, gotta, you're gonna have this for the rest of your life and your parents are coming down on you, but your, your friends are wanting you to say, blow it off. Teenage years and then the hormones. Holy shit. Teenage is hard. Randy, I'm so glad you stopped being. I love you too, doll baby. So, you know, the, my only claim to fame was the family curse. Most males in the family, including me, start to get gray hair at 16, and I had black hair, so it became salt and pepper. Oh, that's sexy. Salt and pepper hair is sexy. My husband started to get some grain. I love it. He hates it. <laughs> but, yeah, salt and pepper hair is sexy. It is. Um, so you're blessed. And you know what? You're young enough to where if you didn't want it, you know, if it happened at 16, you could have always colored it. But you realize that it was a good thing. So that's good. But, um, you know, we're talking about, we started out talking about depression and well, I don't think we ever got to anxiety. But now we're talking about finding our place and finding happiness in our world and Finding happiness within ourselves, no matter what our age. And that, yeah, is your husband, he is five years younger. And, um, I had no idea until we'd been dating for a good long while. He thought I was younger than what I was. And, I mean, I told him my age, so it wasn't like any big deal. You know, I've never been ashamed to tell my age. But for some reason, he didn't hear it right. And it wasn't until we'd been dating. I I guess probably a year and a half. He was like, "You're five years older than me." I'm like, "Yeah, uh, yeah." Is that all right? He's like, "Yeah, it's fine with me." He says, "I just I didn't know." I'm like, okay, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm a cradle robber. But he actually he's very mature. He always has been. He's very mature for his age. He's very quiet. You know, I talk all the time, so he's quiet, yin and yang. <laughs> but. I have a lot of respect for him. And I think that that makes the difference. Um, sometimes when you date somebody that's a lot younger and you see them behaving in ways that are maybe a little more immature or, you know, they, they aren't thinking things through, then you you can't respect them fully. But I've been very lucky. I, I'm with a man that I have total respect for. He... Uh, even when we fuss, and we fuss, um, but still, there's, you know, I still respect him, and I'm very proud of him. Uh, you know, he's his career is amazing, and you know, there are all these things that you want to check off in a relationship, and I'm, I'm like, ding, 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 ding. There's always one or two things, you know, that we can improve on, but. Uh, yeah, he's, he's mature. And thank you, Leanna. I appreciate that. I feel like I'm a very lucky woman. He's, he's a very mature man and he's very responsible. And he likes, he, you know, I'm, in case y'all haven't noticed, I'm a nurturer. I want to make people feel better. I want to make people happy. That's, that's always been me. I want people to smile. I want people to be, to have everything they need. Um, if you come in my house, you get something to drink. You know, you get a glass of tea or pop or water, or whatever you want. And then I feed you. And that's one of the ways that I'm a nurturing person. 
he is like that as well. He's not, I mean, he's not all feeding the handy thing, but he understands that that's how I nurture people. But he nurtures people like he takes care of all the bills. Like he does our finances. I don't ever have to worry about that because I frankly hate it. There is nothing worse to me. If you told me I had to go back to doing, to pay the bills every month and uh, put so much in the savings and so much of this and that and the other, I'd go out of my mind. I'd just hire an accountant again. Um, it, it, it just, he takes care of that. He, he takes care of things like, um, runs, running dogs to the bed and seeing that the yard's always mowed and that the flowers I choose, because a lot of times if my hands aren't working, you know, and I'm not able to get around, um, I'll say, I want this, 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 and this done this way. And he's like, okay, I got you. You know, like I'm the designer and he's the engineer, which he is an engineer. So, um, you know, it's, it's that working together. If you find someone, no matter what age you are or they are, but, uh, yeah, Chloe, isn't it funny? Men can have a younger woman, but people always say things about a woman with a younger man. And that's what I, I don't ever really tell my age. Or, or his age in comparison, like it would go out anywhere. Most people don't know that he's younger than me. And that's because he acts so mature. And I guess I told him my age. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chalk it up to that. I look so young. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that's, I think that comes from, uh, you know, our history, our genetics, because younger women are able to breed quicker. And uh, it's healthier for them to have children. So men can, and men can uh, procreate up until the day they die. And now there's, people are starting to say, you know, maybe that 90 year old sperm isn't so great, even if it is regenerated, because we know that the DNA breaks down over time. And that's what makes it age. But, um, you know, there's a specific part of the DNA, and I'm not going to go into all that. But, um, you know, so maybe a 90 year old, a 20 year old getting together ain't going to have such a healthy kid, you know, but we know that women after age 30, the risks of birth defects is much higher um, for downs, uh, you know, all, all sorts of different things. And that's why they want you to get an amniocentesis after 35 or some say after 40, but I think after 35, and that's why I'm, my daughter's 27. I'm like, okay, you got. You got to say seven years and then you need to have a baby. But, um, hi Kelly. Hi doll baby. How are you? But I think that's, Chloe, I think that's wise because men, men are supposed to have established their careers and their fortunes and, you know, have a home set up and be ready to, be ready to take care of a wife. And then they go get some 12 year old who's just started menses and, you know, and they get her pregnant and, that way, if she dies, they can get another one. And uh, the way that women have been treated in history is awful. But um, women over women did not live back uh, back in, in the 1800s. Women's ages, I mean, they were dying at 50, and it's usually because they were worn out. I mean, I've read accounts, and I know of people who had great grandparents, grandparents, great grandparents who had 12, 15 kids until the mother just literally wore out. And, but like when you live on a farm, your kids are your farm hands. They're free labor. But, and then they would get another wife and she would usually be younger and then they would do the same to her. But, um, you know, it's, it's sad how women have been treated in history. But now, now we can fit off having children if we want, but we don't want to put it off too far. Yeah. So, so a 50 year old man is more likely to have a child with genetic chromosome defects than a 25 year old man. Not necessarily a 50 year old, but we're talking like 80s. When men start, when at 50, at 50 a man is considered to be healthy, um, in general, unless he has, unless he has like mental, mental problems or, you know, phys, severe physical problems that will be passed down. But, but those things start to come out as they get older and they're seeing that older fathers can affect the children, you know, not quite as much as the older mother, but yeah, as they do. Um, 
you know, we see kids, uh, a lot of older, a lot of older fathers, and I'll probably get a lot of crap for this. The children end up on the spectrum uh, when they're tested. There's, uh, you know, there's just a higher rate of learning disorders. And we see that with older fathers and younger mothers. I mean, I see it in my office. And and I don't say anything. I don't say anything like, you know, hey, maybe you should have had kids when you were younger. You know, because you can't. You can't. But I would caution anyone who is thinking about becoming a parent to do it while they're younger. You know, make your money, get your career started, get yourself settled, but have it while you're at your healthiest. Oh, this conversation is making you sad. I don't want to make you sad, sweetheart. My husband is 15 years older than me, and besides my son, he has the best thing that's ever happened to me. He doesn't eat, look his age easier. Oh, that is so wonderful, Angie. See, you know, you can you can have marriages that have a span that are very happy and very healthy. If both people are healthy and dedicated to each other, I'm fine with that. Oh, Lord knows, you know. But, yeah, an 80-year-old man having kids, it's really unfair to the children because, what, are they going to be 98 when their kids graduate high school? You know, who's going to play ball in the yard? Who's going to, you know, who's going to take them to the father-daughter dance? It's, you know, you, you have to be responsible when you have children. And you have to think of all these things. And I knew I wanted to have my daughter young. You know, I have friends who didn't have children until they were in their 30s. You know, early 30s, thankfully, but, you know, and and they're great moms. And I had my child young. And, yeah, there were times that I struggled, but I got through that. And she'll tell you now that I'm her best friend. And, uh, you know, and so we all we all choose, hopefully. Hopefully we, you know, we make our choices when we want to have when we want to have kids or when we want to become parents or if we even want to become parents. There is no law. Remember this. It says you have to have kids. You could be happily married without children. And you're still in your spouse. You know. And your wife was 10 years older than me. So as long as it's legal age, it's okay. But I would never get with someone under 20. Yeah. Um, it would be really hard to, like, I can't imagine, because, because my daughter's 27, I can't imagine having uh, uh, dating someone that would be younger than my kid. Uh, that to me would, I, I just don't think my mind could encompass it. Now there are people who do it, but, you know, and that's what to do, but I, I just couldn't do with it. Yeah, I was 20. You know what, Lynn? I was 20 years, six months, 15 days, 12 hours old when I had my daughter. I'll close that. <laughs> Talk about numbers. We have a little thing, and, and I joke about it. There's numerology. But that's why she and I get along together because it was, you know, it, it was such a precise amount. I mean, it was, you know, 20 years, half a year, half a day between us. So I wonder. Your, my husband and I decided not to have kids. Now he's trying to use that against me in the divorce. He cannot use that against you in a divorce. You just tell him flat out and you tell your lawyer to tell him that um, your mutual decision not to have children has no bearing in a divorce. And that if he'd wanted children, you all could adopt. That adoption's open. And there are millions of foster children in this country that he could have very happily said, let's let's have some foster children. And and if you want, we'll go hunting down and kick his ass because that's a shitty thing to say to somebody. You know, using someone's like my husband never wanted kids. I need to fix my lipstick or something because I got my whole mouth. My husband never wanted to have children. It was not in his wheelhouse. He is one of the most loving and giving stepfathers that you would ever want to make. And I'm serious about that. My daughter. My daughter will tell you, she has nothing to do with her dad, her real dad. I guess you could call him real dad. But um, he doesn't he doesn't call her. And, I mean, they don't see each other at holiday, nothing. And it hurt her for a long time. But then I told her, I said, you know, that's okay. You've got a stepdaddy who loves you and will do anything for you. And he would. I mean, if my daughter called right now and said to him, 
not to me because I probably went. I gotta find my. I've got to find my foot uh, moisturizer. If my daughter called me right now and said, Mom, I need $1,000 bail money, I'd say, You're out of your damn mind. She called her stepdaddy and said, I need $1,000 bail money. Don't tell mom. He'd do it. I'll tell you right now, he'd do it. Honey, I want Susie, you to stay. We're just talking about backgrounds, talking about, you know, relationships. And sometimes it's good. I know you're going through depression and uh, you know you're having a hard time. But sometimes it's good to to think about things other than straight depression because maybe you can figure out where your depression is coming from. You know, we our depression and our anxiety and our fears they all come from the source. Whether it's the way we're brought up. Whether it's the way we live now, whether it's things that have affected us, whether it's genetic, whether it's work, situational, whatever, you know, so you have no one, but you can. Just think, we're talking about being in our 40s and, you know, hang on just a second. We're talking about being in our 40s and finding love. There is no date too late. To find somebody. And I do believe. And I do believe that there is someone for everyone. You know. There. There is. There is a person out there. And I want Sushi. You just haven't met them yet. Honey. I do believe that there is someone. Somewhere. Who is sitting probably on a computer. And maybe just be on the wrong live stream. And they're saying, gosh, I wish I had someone to care and love me and that I could love them and give them my attention and my affection. There's someone there. You just got to keep your heart open and your mind open and you'll find it. You know what? And until that person comes, you have a room full of people. There's six feet of us in here who are all being supportive and caring and we care about you. So. You know, that's, you can't, if you keep saying no, then it won't happen. But if you say yes, there's a possibility, then there is. You know, when, yeah, you have all of us. You know, and there's, there's something that I say, and I, I say it in my words of wisdom. If you follow my Twitter with the words of wisdom, when my Twitter starts working. Um, there is no amount of guilt that will change the past. There is no amount of anxiety that will change the future. We only have today. And we need to make the most of it. And I truly believe that. Yeah. That's a good question, man. And Andy, with your depression and anxiety, you know, I hope that, you know, by coming and listening and being a part of our group chat that it can help. And I hope you're, I hope you're seeing a therapist and I hope you're, you know, working your program and, uh, taking your medication, whatever medication they've got you on. If it's working for you and you're keeping on it. And if it's not, then you'll find something new. Um, you know, I'm proud that you're here and because it's always when we seek help, it's a step in the right direction. Sushi, I'd love to talk to you privately. Um, you said you won't let a man touch you for all the money in the world. Now, that can mean several things. You've been really hurt by a man. Um, hi, Shell Bell. Hi, darling. Sushi, you've either been really hurt by a man and are afraid and have had something horrible happen or you find men unattractive and maybe, you know, as they say, maybe we swing in the other direction. Um, maybe we prefer women. Now, either way, 
we can we can talk about it and we can get to the bottom of it to where you're not as anxious and depressed about the subject. And uh you know, you can you can find love in many ways. If you never feel like you could be comfortable with a man, then you can find women who are good friends, even if even if you're not lesbian, women who are good friends who give you the love and support and relationship you need. But um okay, well if you're not lesbian then you know I, I hate to hear that something horrible has happened to make you to make you feel like that and to give you that fear and angst and you know, positive as they say in Italian. But there's a way to find peace with it and you know, and learn to learn that whoever hurt you, you know, they are not the norm. And yeah, and you know, a lot of times if you can't deal with being close to a human, I'll say get a pet. Get you know, get you a dog. Get you a cat. Cats are kind of snobby. I'll be honest with you. Cats aren't as good a support animal, in my opinion. Um, get you a dog that needs you, that loves you, that wants to sit on you. Like a Maltese. Like, um, you know, like wiener dogs. My wiener dogs are on me all the time. Y'all see that. Um, but they're yappy. But get you a little French pug or, you know, go adopt. Adopt you something that you know, well, if the person's dead, it doesn't mean that, you know, what they did doesn't hurt you anymore. You know, somebody can stab you and die. You're still stabbed, right? So you have to heal from that. So you get, I'd love to see, I'd, I'd love to have you talk to me and tell me that, hey, you know, I went to the animal shelter today. And I uh, found a beautiful little dog that I could keep in my house. And, you know, I got him all groomed up and he's coming home with me and I've given him a life and he's given me support. You know, the, the important thing is you need to have a connection with something. We all need love in our life. And let me tell you, a good, good little dog will love you to pieces. And it'll also help you. It'll give you, it'll help you with your, you know, your support. And when you're feeling low, it'll come to you and, you know, it'll grieve with you. It'll laugh with you. It'll, it'll give you comfort. Oh, thank you, Shelville. We were talking about, um, I, where I didn't get to go on last Saturday. I was so sick. Um, the flare was kicking my butt. <laughs> My face was so red. My face was beat red. I mean, it, I had to take off Friday from work and then Saturday I couldn't do anything. Sunday I couldn't do anything. Monday I was still kind of worthless, but I was trying to, I was trying to do some, but it wasn't until Monday night that I started feeling better. But thank you, sweetheart. But my face was so red. But yet yeah, sushi, you know, all of us here that you see are reaching out to you. And we want to give you help. And listen, um, like I was saying, my Twitter's acting crazy and not, uh, it's not letting me, uh, log in. It's not wanting to identify me or something. I don't know. But, um, you can, you can always DM me. My DMs are always open. You have two cats. Okay. Um, you know, they, you need, you need to have a support animal that is very loving. Cats, like I say, cats. And I'm not against cats. Um, but the, the dogs seem to work better, not just with me, but with people I work with. But if you love your cats, you love your cats. And, um, you know, but you've got all of us here and we want to give you support. And, you know, and if you have no interest in sex, yeah, okay. That, hey, that's, that's fun. You know, uh, there are people who have gone through traumatic things, uh, rape, molestation, uh, you name it. And they just decide, eh, that's it for me. That's okay. You know, I'm not one of, I feel like I got the shit on my teeth. Um, I'm not one of these people that says, you know, to have a good relationship, you have to have sex once a week, twice a week, three times a week. Okay. 
you can have a great relationship that gives you all the emotional support and love you need with a good friend. Male or female, whatever you're most comfortable with, whoever you're, whoever you bond with, you know, if you have, like you said, your dad was creepy. You know, and that, that has damaged you. I don't know what your dad did. I don't know why you feel that way. You know, like I say, you're not in, not in my office, you know, open up. But, you know, if you're not comfortable with men, then that's, that's fine. Find your best girlfriend that is a BFF and someone that you can do things with. You can, whether it's just go out to coffee, go into Wendy's and getting a frosty, um, maybe taking a vacation. You know, that X is all off. Great for panic and Zoloft. Zoloft is, I'm sorry about Zoloft. Um, I have a friend, or I had a friend. I don't have anything to do with her because anymore because really she screwed me over and, uh, she's, she went down the meth road. We'll just put it that way. Okay. But when we were younger, we were very much friends, close friends and, you know, where I've always, I've always had an interest in psychology and she was just having, she was, she was so crazy. She was so, and when I say crazy, it was just like, she would, she would blow up one minute and be crying the next. And I'm like, you're depressed. I said, you have severe depression. And she said, oh, no, what I have? But she was drinking all the time and she was taking every pill that came along. I said, you got to stop this. And, you know, and I was taking care of her daughter and her daughter and my daughter were best of friends. And I was worried for her daughter. I was really worried that she was going to physically hurt her daughter. So I talked her into going to the doctor and asking for some Zoloft because Zoloft is great. It's a great medication. And um, she could miss. She started on it and she changed. It was it was great. She was in control of her emotions. She wasn't crying like she was. She wasn't having angry outbursts. Um, she wanted to drink. And I mean, she was drinking like, you know, between 12 and 24 Bud Lights a night. It was, it was seriously bad. That's why I was, I was like taking her daughter and keeping her with me. And she was sleeping in my daughter's bed with her and they were like sisters. But, um, the thing is, she would, she would have her daughter and if she missed a pill, her daughter would remind her, she'd say, Mommy, have you taken your happy pill today? And that's what her daughter called it on her own. And, uh, you know, as long as she stayed on the soft, she was, she was back to being who she was meant to be, who, who I became friends with and was friends with. And then she quit and, um, just went down here and she lost custody of her daughter. And it was just really bad. But to know that a medication could do so much good, that that was one of the reasons that I wanted to study psychology and um, how to help people. But Zoloft, it either works really well or it doesn't work. If Zoloft doesn't work for you, there are plenty of other medications that uh, you can try. Different meds for different hands. Um, Selexa works well. Selexa is like a cleaned up version of Lexapro. And then um, Effexor is in that same group and um you know they all kind of it's like their brother and sisters they if one doesn't work quite so well then you go to another one it works a little better and another one works a little better that's why you have to kind of try different ones um i was on lexapro for a long time then all of a sudden it quit it was like whoa i went from being normal to being really depressed and um my doctor said, okay, well, you've been on it a long time. And, you know, because I did, I, I had severe depression. And he said, let's try um, some balsam. And you know what? It worked really well for me. And uh, I don't take it now. I don't need it now. But um, thank God. But it really did help. So sometimes a medication will work really great for one person and not another. Sometimes it'll work for a while. You know, they all have lifespans and uh, you have to you have to be willing to try new things. And, you know, 
Yeah, Sandy, that's that's a lot of times with depression because depression and anger and anxiety are all right there together. So you don't know whether you want to kill yourself, kill somebody, or you know just scream your head off and explode. So that's why the you know when we get on a good antidepressant, it it takes all of those, and that's why people with anxiety, I say, take an antidepressant, try that first. Now, if you have Xanax, um, like I have panic attacks and I haven't talked a lot about that. You know, I have anxiety, I have generalized anxiety disorder and uh, I control it with behavioral therapy. But if I have a panic attack, I, I the, the Xanax works. Now, I don't want to take it all the time because it's very addictive. And you know, it, it, it's something like clonopin, which I was on clonopin for a while for the GAD, and it just, it just made me feel like bleh. And I'm like, that's not me. You all, you all know, you can tell that I'm kind of like a little bit hyper. Well, I have ADHD, but um, I, I've always been very outgoing, very get it, get it, get it. So to take something that really dropped me like that, it, it didn't work. For me, I was not happy with the way I felt. But if I have a panic attack, because sometimes this da 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 that I go through, it gets over the top and it's scary. And I think I'm having a heart attack. I think, um, you know, my chest is going to explode. I can't breathe. Um, I start talking really fast. I talk fast anyway, but I talk really fast. But I get scared. It's terrifying. And then I take a little bit of venom and I'm okay. But uh, you don't want to take it every day. You don't want to get addicted to it because then it doesn't work. So let's see. Oh, Michelle, Michelle, I'm sorry, you had a migraine. Um, Lynn, I took uh some balta. I, I had to think for a minute. I took Cymbalta after the Lexapro and it worked beautifully. I mean, um, and now I've never had brain zaps, you know, in withdrawal when I'm switching, when I've had to switch a medication. Some people do, um, but I never did. But Cymbalta was, it was great. It helped a lot with the anxiety. I had fewer panic attacks, much less anxiety. Um, I also had less fibro pain. It works for that as well, which is cool. Um, but my, my depression, it lifted, it was great. So, uh, Sushi, I would like to talk to you honestly, one-on-one. -on -one. I know you're going through so much and you've hinted on different things. Um, I think, I, I really think you need individual counseling and I would be happy to help you find that. If you want to, if you want to get in touch with me, I will be happy. Hi, Erica. And if you have PST, PTSD, bleh, <laughs> my mouth tangling up. Like me, you get a strong mix of anxiety, anger, and depression. It's like a cocktail for male. Thank God for Prozac. Amen. You know, PTSD is such an interesting disorder. And I've worked with, you know, quite a few people who have uh, self support. And in my opinion, it's, uh, you know, you're going into the fight or flight and you want to either kill somebody, you know, kill yourself, be hard. It's that whole fight or flight. And you've got all of that mixed up with depression and guilt. And when you've gone through a traumatic situation, whether it's war, whether it's abuse, uh, whether it's even a really bad car wreck or something like that, you have it. It changes your brain chemistry so much. Um, and that's why it's and and it does it differently for different people. That's why there's no one cure. That's why people say, oh, all vets with PTSD need to smoke pot. No, because it won't work for all of them. It won't work for some of them. It won't work for all of them. Prozac is a great medication for that. Um, you know, they it, the whole thing is is you want to make sure that because there's a high chance of addiction, right? Like drinking, you you know that. Uh, People with PTSD, because they're constantly trying to feel normalized, they're trying to deaden those feelings a lot, get hooked on alcohol. 
call at different types of drugs, so we have to watch for that. But um, if we can get them to stay on a good, uh, good cocktail, like uh, you know, an antidepressants and an anti, usually an antipsychotic, because oftentimes there will be hallucinations, like auditory hallucinations, like they'll hear a firecracker and then they'll hear gunfire. And I'm talking about like military personnel. Um, it's you know, if you can get them on the right cocktail, it it can really be helped. But talk therapy helps best of all. Um, let's see. Lynn, if you um, it, it is hard to come off of, but if it works, it works very well. But some people come off of Prozac easier than others. Some have no side effects. Some have some have hard ones. It just depends. It really does, but your doctor, your doctor knows you, and he knows your medical history. But uh, you know, if yeah, and panic attacks, yeah. The first time I had one, I was, I have. This is so strange. I have been having anxiety and panic since I was in the fifth grade. I did not know what it was. Um, all I knew was that I had that I thought I was going to die, and my stomach would nod up and my chest would hurt and they would call my parents and my mom would take me to the hospital where she would be at work and then I would go lay in the nurse's lounge and I never got treatment for it so I've been dealing with this literally since I was 10 years old but um it got easier somewhere in my mid-20s I don't know why and then it came back and it hit me right in the chest like somebody kicked me I thought I was having a heart attack I went down on the floor um, they, it, the ambulance was called and they said, you're not having a heart attack, you're having a panic attack. And I'm like, no, no, I can't be. And, uh, it was, it, it was so scary. And each one has been scary. And, you know, and I'd have anxiety attacks, but it wouldn't, it, it would be like I would cry and get it all out. I would just cry uncontrollably, but this was serious pain. But they started me on Ativan and then, you know, we, I actually got some help. So that was, that was good. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sushi, if you were prescribed Prozac, why not take it? Do you not want to get better? Um, bashful dame, it depends. It depends on your own body chemistry. Um, some people have what they call brain zaps, which makes you feel like for a second, like in the middle of your head. But, uh, that's usually over with in a week or two. And it doesn't, it's not a continual thing. But if you're, if you titrate off of effects or properly, you shouldn't have those. But the ones, the patients that just quit and they don't lower their dose daily, slowly, um, yeah, they, they can sometimes have the zaps. But, you know, if you, if you follow your doctor's advice and you go down slowly, you should, you should have no trouble. You know, shouldn't be too hard. Sushi, if your doctor is giving you Prozac and you're unhappy and you know you're unhappy and you know that you've got depression and you've got anxiety and you've got these things, if you want to get better, then you have to take the medicine. And I know you have an eating disorder, but you, there are no calories in Prozac and you can take it on an empty stomach. It will help you with the bulimia. It will help you with the compulsion. If if you don't take it, it can't help you. So, yeah, and I'm sure your doctor knows you you were strict and are bulimic, doesn't he? Good, Basil. Yeah, you you know if you know that you're in if you know that you're in a cycle. Where and and I've been there, 
And I have patients who have been there, you know, and you go into a cycle where you're, you know, you're bending and purging. Um, yes, yes, it does. It helps with the bulimia because it helps with your compulsion to do things, you know. Um, please take it. Don't throw it up when you're, you know, there has to be a part of your day when you go for two hours and you are not vomiting. Right? Take it at the beginning of that two hours and say, I'm not doing anything till my Prozac is in my system. You have to have that control over yourself. Okay? You are the only one that can do this. You know, it's, I, I'm telling you, it, it really, it, you really need to take it and it's, it's going to help you on a lot of levels. Yeah, Erica, I, I'm telling you, Prozac is the shit. Prozac, if you have been suffering with depression and anxiety and, you know, eating disorders as well, um, and you go on Prozac, you're going to be like, what the fuck? Why didn't they give me this way back? You know, uh, why didn't I, why didn't I have this before? Same with Paxil. Paxil, it, it Paxil worked for me that way as well. I was like, oh my God, I feel fantastic. You know, I, you have to take the medication and once it works, it works. And you're going to be like, why did I do this before? You know? Yeah, Prozac is an oldie but a goodie. Listen, some of the oldest medications are the ones that work the best. They really do. Why can't light therapy and behavior modification before the doctor gives you a pill? Does your recovery always have to be a pill? No, it doesn't. But light therapy only works when you are in SAD, seasonal affective disorder. Okay. Uh, so unless he knows that that's the exact kind of depression that you're dealing with, then light therapy is not going to is not going to be an option. Behavior modification should be used with medication. Um, whether it's CBT or DBT, then you need to have medication with it. Now, DBT is for borderline, and they only give you medication with that to help with the symptoms like uh, panic, anxiety, severe depression. But you know, we want to make sure that we want to make sure that your body chemistry is doing what it's supposed to and then then we get then you get to my part that's the behavior modification like therapy uh psychoanalysis talk therapy whatever you know um i do that but it's in conjunction with the medication and eventually uh some people are able to you know stop the medication you know if the situation that they were in say if they were taking medication for situational depression, which is, you know, a divorce or they've lost a loved one, a grieving, um, lost child. There are all sorts of horrible things that can cause us to go into a depression. We call that situational depression and we give, um, you know, three months, well, never three months, six months, nine months, a year with an antidepressant. And if there are other things that need to be helped with, yeah. But then you get to see somebody like me and you do talk therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. And, uh, you know, we we work out what's going on and what's making you feel the way you do. And then, you know, as time goes on, you know, and your grieving is less, you're able to handle handle the situation and you started to heal. Then uh, we cut back on the medication for those people. So it's. It's really great. Erica, that's funny. We sit at my office too. <laughs> we really do. Well, you know, lithium is found in water. Lithium is one. If you're not familiar, lithium is one of the oldest antidepressants there were. The Indians actually used it. And St. John's wort. St. John's wort works. It's a mild, mildly effective uh you have to take, if you take the powder, you have to take it three times a day, regularly, religiously, for it to work. But it does work, you know, mildly. Lithium, however, is amazing. 
Now, lithium is found in springs, and it, it comes up through the water. And the uh, problem is there's no way to control it. Excuse me. So you might get a cup of lithium water and take a drink of it, and you might get one dose and then do the same thing the next thing. You might get another dose. Also, it's very hard on the liver. And if you or anyone you know has ever been on lithium, they have to get, uh, you know, liver panels on every three months. Some more often, it just depends on uh, what their health is. So, you know, even even Native Americans, and I said Indians, I guess I should have said Native Americans, but even Native Americans knew that there was something to this stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just amazing that I always think that for every disease out there, there is some natural cure. However, that natural cure probably needs to be put in a lab and modified so it's you can get a stable dose of it. But I think that nature leads us to that. Yeah, yeah Prozac does take your appetite. You will get you. And let me tell you, it not only takes your appetite, it gives you energy. So you're going to want to exercise. You're going to want to do things. You may not want to go jogging, but you're damn sure going to want to clean your house. Um, it. It makes you feel good. You feel good about things. Uh, Prozac, Prozac is better than Effexor for some people. Effexor is better than Prozac for other people. So, um, Selecta is, is good. It, it's, it's been around, what, 20 years now? It, it really is. It's excellent. The only thing that I, um, the only thing that I am worried a little bit about that I get concerned about is all of the new antipsychotics that say, oh, we're for bipolar disorder. Oh, I forget. No, you're for delusional thinking and for fixation and for hallucination. An antipsychotic is an antipsychotic is an antipsychotic. Now, while some bipolar people, uh, some people with bipolar disorder, uh, especially it seems type one, you know, there's type one, type two, and then there's the other two times, the uh, next and uh, the I can't even remember the name. I have to look it up. Anyway, there's four kinds, but manic the manic state. A lot of a lot of severe bipolar patients they fixate on religion. They will fixate on ideas. They will have hallucinations. They will they will start having behaviors that they repeat. They um they basically show signs. Of psychosis and so with those patients yes it is warranted to have uh, to have an antipsychotic but if you're just going through mania and depression then no uh, you should be treated with you know an antidepressant and a may stabilizer okay um, my new doctor suggested inpatient I won't get locked up why you know it says she ever <laughs> This is another thing. Why do people think that going into hospital is such a terrible experience? It's not. It is a vacation from everything. You get to concentrate only on you and only on you healing and getting better. If you want to, is Prozac hard on the liver? Yes. Yeah, you have to, she will need to have labs done. Um, but Sushi, if you want to get better, and I think you do. Then you need to listen to your doctor. And you know what? Go to the hospital. It is not a bad place to be. You know, you're in there with other people who are concentrating on themselves. You don't have to worry about anybody. You don't have to worry about paying bills. You don't have to worry about anything. All you do is take care of you. And hi Lacey. Sushi, you need to you need to be a little selfish with this. You know. We know that eating disorders are based on our need for control, right? And that's why we do it. If we feel like we don't have control in other parts of our lives, then we use that as a way to control this, control our body, control what we eat. Um, if you need help with that and you want to feel in control, then you making the decision to go into the hospital and you making the decision to take care of yourself. 
is the greatest control of all. Well, think about it. Well, and if you want to talk more about it, like I said, get in touch with me. Uh, Erica, that does sound schizophrenic. When, uh, the, when they start giving out antipsychotics to bipolar patients who aren't schizophrenic, then all it does is make them fat and sleepy and damages their pancreas. It, it's irresponsible to me. And I see GPs, I have patients come to me and they're on psych meds and I'll say, okay, what are you taking? And they'll say, well, I'm on, you know, this antidepressant, but then I'm on Latuda. I'm like, why are you on Latuda? I said, you know, are you on Lamictal? Lamictal would mean stabilizer. Uh, are you on this or that and the other, death coat, whatever? And I'll say, no. I just take the antidepressant and then the Latuda or there's, and, and I'm using that as an example. There's about 10 new ones out. And I'm like, what made him decide to do it? Well, he had some samples and he said it might help for bipolar disorder. That pisses me off. Okay, anti antipsychotics are not mood stabilizers. Right? They don't help with the top end. Your mood stabilizer gets gets rid of that top end. Da -da 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 that bipolar people get. Okay, bipolar one more than bipolar two. But um, then you need the antidepressant to take care of the blah 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 the low part. Okay, where that comes when they come in together, then you get your behavior within a normal range that you control. You can still get angry. You can still get happy and a little hyper sometimes. But, you know, you, you have your feelings, but you don't have the out of control feelings. An antipsychotic should only be given when the depression is so low that you're hallucinating or so high you're hallucinating or you're fixating on things or um, say, okay, quarters. They believe that they have to keep everything. Okay, that's a fixation. Um, they believe that if they throw any little thing out, maybe the government will get it, or uh, they might need it later, or somebody might need it, or they're going to do something with it one of these days, and so they keep it. That's the patient that I would say, okay, let's let's do a mild antipsychotic, you know, or somebody who believes constantly that they can't ride in a car with anyone because they'll kill them that every time they drive a car they have to be alone in the car uh because they they are they'll have an accident and be responsible for someone's death uh you know and these these are things that we do treat with an antipsychotic or if they're hearing voices or they feel like unless they go to church this church every sunday almost a cult-like behavior um even though it may be just a regular church, you know, that's when we do that, not otherwise. So. Matronista, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a licensed psychologist, so you know what? Yeah, I am. I'm educating people on medication. And I have no problem with that. Neither does my office. Um, yeah, sushi, you need to decide whether you want to get better or stay the same or maybe get worse. You, you have to work, but, you know, how well are you able to cope working? You know, if, if you're not feeling well and you're sick and you're hurting yourself and you're getting sicker, it might be that I did take a few weeks off, you know, and they have met, they have medical leave. Yeah, bashful thing, that's the thing. People don't understand. If you go to the hospital, you're going to come out feeling better. It's, it's going to give you, it's going to give you what you need. So your days on your own and then the continued therapy is going to work better. Sometimes we all need. Listen, I've been in the ICU, I don't know how many times. Every time I came out of the ICU, I wasn't going to die. You know? So I needed to be in the ICU. If you go into, you know, if you go inpatient in a medical hospital, it's because you need help and you want to feel better. And when you come out, you don't feel better. 
you're going to start living your life with being able to breathe. You know, when it gets too much, you know, you need to take a break. Take a break from work. Take a break from family. Take a break from all of it and just take care of you. And, um, you know, and you can make excuses. I have to work. My family will be embarrassed. Uh, I don't have the money. You'll find the money. Your family is not going to be embarrassed. They're going to be glad you're getting help. And your work will have you back when it's over with. So, you can't see that comment. It's up there a little ways. And, you know, I don't really care. I, you know, somebody wants to, wants to think that, you know, I'm not allowed to give generalized medical advice and you know that's all now but yeah you if you're faking it then you know are you doing yourself or your co-workers any good um you may sandy you need to you need to check with your doctor it depends on what's going on with your liver Erica, they are food stabilizers. It's, you know, the thing is, Sushi, Chloe's right. You don't want to live on the street. But I don't think, I don't think any job is going to put you out because you went in the hospital if you worked there for a while. Hey, my city reviews. Love you. I'm doing better. I'm doing much better. I'm out. I'm coming out of flare, thank God. Um, you know, you have to you have to decide what what you want to do. How how you're going to do it? If if you want to if you want to not deal with depression and anxiety and an eating disorder, and you know, try to pretend like everything's okay at work. If you want to stop that and actually heal and then when you come back be the genuine person you are without all of these issues then listen to your doctor your doctor knows what you need go in patient for a little bit and see what it's like you know make it voluntary go in for a week and if you don't like it come out but at least try you know not all not all jobs but yeah see if you're losing your cool um, you, you, you're starting to lose the battle. You're, you know, the, the mask is starting to come off. So that's why I'm encouraging you to listen to your doctor. And, you know, we'll find help if, you know, if you don't have insurance, you know, if some insurance pays, great. Some doesn't. Um, if it doesn't, then there are, there are other facilities that you can go to. Your doctor can, can, get you in them believe me if if you're in dire needs in this country we have uh state-run facilities you know state and federal-run facilities actually that will take you in without insurance most people don't realize that but there are places that will take you and they will help you okay my work only gives me 12 weeks off and then you lose your position and when you're you're terminated. Yeah, that's and and that's scary. But if she needs to take six weeks, say, to go to get treatment, then that's they're not gonna fire you for that. You know. Um legally they can't, honestly. If you're not taking all your, you know, time off and you're get, and you're actually in the hospital. They may they may reduce your position. They can even reduce your salary, but I don't think they can. I mean, the last the last time I heard anything about it, they can't actually fire you for being sick. And by the way, hi, Stacey Nathan. I love you to death. And can you please put in Les's, um, Les's uh, stream thing so we can raise her money? In case you missed it at the beginning, we're raising money for Les to get a computer so she can do her live stream games, so she can work, and so she can do everything that she needs. And I'll put his mama bear off because mm, you know how we feel about her. But anyway, so we are raising money for her. If you'll put, uh, if y'all will put her link in the chat, I would really appreciate it. And 
if you can't donate right now, you can actually come back to the chat and get the web address and and donate later. Even if it's a dollar, you know, even if it's five dollars, we're just trying to raise money for Cosby Lover. And then um listen, Station Ace, we were talking about, you know, this weekend um they're doing the little Rosie uh fundraiser on I think Uber and Stephanie Brown and uh Wendy and several others. They're doing that to pay for her chemo. Well, we have a lady in here, Sandy, and um, she's in a pretty dire situation as well. I mean, literally not having money to eat, and we can't have that happen. So we're going to do um, we're going to do a fundraiser for her. I think we're going to do it a little bit differently. See if we can't get Walmart's. Or we'll get her set up with a Walmart's uh, account online that will ship it to her house, and then people can give gift cards or they can donate. So her PayPal, either way, we'll work it out. we got to figure all that out. I'll get with her. But um, Amazon Prime also has a service, but I don't know if they're in her area. But I do know that Walmart does, and they will ship her food within two days. So that way we won't. Um, wait a minute, honey. Let me make you a mod. That way, that way we, can't ha we won't have Sandy going hungry. There you go, bud. Okay, you're a moderator. And... You know, we want Sushi to be, we want Sushi to get her help and we want her to, you know, get everything she needs. And I, I want to see Sandy get what she needs. And Les, L E Z, she has, um, I want Sushi, I don't know if you've been in her chat before. But I, I hope you will sub to her. Please, if if you all aren't subbed to Les and you don't know who she is, it's T-H-E-L-E-Z. And it's all capitalized. And it's a space in between. But um, she does from midnight until like 6 a.m. usually. And she has games and uh, all sorts of stuff in there. And it's so mellow. And it's such a, it's a loving, calm environment. And it's funny. And we joke. And. I was up my last night and I was cracking up. I couldn't go back to bed because I was laughing so hard. But, um, you know, please, please donate to her, but sub to her. You'll get to know her. You'll love her like we all do. And, um, yeah, we just, we love our lads. She's, she's the queen of the night, she says, and I agree. She's got her a crown and everything. But, um, oh, there's, there's her stream. Good. And, you know, I want Sushi, if you go in to positive chats like hers and like here where we love each other and we're supportive of each other, then um, that's going to make you feel better about yourself, too, when you see that there are people who care and love. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, my shitty reviews. I love you. I love you. Thank you. Your, your channel that just cracks me up. <laughs> but, um. But yeah, Les is wonderful, and I really want us to help her as much as possible. And then, and then we're gonna do Rosie on Saturday, and I'm gonna get with Sandy and set uh, set up uh, hers, and we're, we'll do like a telethon. And we might do a telethon, or I don't know whether to do a telethon, or do an auction, or just just a phone pricer. But uh, you know, with Walmart, you can buy gift cards. And you can put money, it, gift cards are basically like money in her account. So when she needs food, she can get it because she she's not getting disability. She's not getting anything. And she's terminal. So we need to, we need to help her. You know, this is good, good people. We need to help her. So she, you don't have to feel guilty for anything. We're in here to talk. Honey, we want you to talk. And we want you to get help. And we want to see you thrive and have a happy life. Because that's what we all deserve, isn't it? Don't we all want to be happy and healthy? I know I do. I want I want it for myself. I want it for my friends. I want it for my family. And, you know, I can... There are very few people that I don't like. And... Most I don't even speak about if I don't care about them. There's some I don't like that are online and I'm just like, yeah. but you know, most everybody that I know, I want to be 
in a good place. I want them to find their joy in life. I want them to to see that there's there's a way to live and live in peace and happiness. You know, and we're not going to be happy all the time. Don't get me wrong. Nobody has a cure all. You know, there's no magic pill that's going to make everything fine every day all the time. But you know, we can work on it. We can have that as our goal. Yeah, a little check, a little fat. If I was doing this in the morning, I'd say, you yeah, know, let's get your coffee. Right now, I'm in a caftan. And I don't know if you ladies wear caftans, but let me tell you, I've ordered like four of them. They are the most comfortable thing. It's not a moo moo, it's a caftan. So, okay. And my husband's like, your boobs are big. I'm like, uh. <laughs> But I wear them with my leggings underneath them, and they are so comfortable. And I'm just like, and this summer I'll lose the leggings and I'll just be, I'll just be like a hippie. I'm going to be like one of those hippie ladies, except for I wear too much good jewelry and a lot of makeup. <laughs> oh. Thank you for answers to my questions. I enjoy being in a drama free channel. Oh, sweetheart, thank you so much. Sub, hit the bell and you'll see. Now I'm on Saturday. I'm getting ready to get off of here because it's 11 o'clock. Um, I'm on Saturday afternoon, every Saturday, unless I'm sick, and then I'll announce it because I was sick last week. But it's at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we talk about um, abuse, domestic violence. It's a serious, it's a serious discussion. Once again, no drama, and uh, we do that for two hours, and then at four we come back and we talk about mental health support. And I think we talked about depression this time. Let's uh, next time we'll pick a topic. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm thinking that uh, maybe we should do we should do something like uh, eating. We could do eating disorders again. We've done that once, and it was. It, I think a lot of people got a lot of a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of good information out of it. But what would you all like the discussion to be for for Saturday for the mental health chats? I mean, we could talk about. I know that narcissistic behavior, narcissists are really, I see so much about that. And I would be more than happy to do, uh, we could do that narcissistic. You know, we could do that. We could do borderlines. We could do bipolar. We could do, uh, and you name it. Uh, there's so much. And, you know, that's why I kind of like the chat lead. But be thinking about what you'd like to talk about. You know, you can tweet me. You can DM me. Uh, you can email me. All my information, once again, is in the description box. And you can self-harm. You know what? That is an excellent, excellent subject because um, we hit on that at the beginning, you know, because ugh, Mama Bear said people who self-harm or were depressed or had, were suicidal were possessed by demons. Well, we proved that wrong biblically, didn't we? But, um, yeah. Let's talk about self-harm because I have uh, lots of interesting stories about patients that I've taken care of and uh, the causes and what goes on in the treatment. And if you would like to join the discussion, just let me know and we can bring it on. You know what? We might have a double. We might do uh, self-harm. For part of it and then for like one hour and then borderline oh god borderline we'd be on here for eight hours but we could def definitely discuss it uh, I, I'm open to topics but and if you would like to come on panel I'm, I always welcome people all you have to do is tell me and um, if my Twitter's still acting acting like a jerk then I'll just put the I'll put the links to your email you can email me Always email me, mamabestworld at gmail.com, and um, I can send you the link if you want to come on and talk. And once again, you can talk with the microphone and the camera on, or you can leave the camera off and just talk anonymously. And uh, I don't know where Jane is. I think she's been off our the Jane Objective. We love her. Um, she's she's one of my mods. And thank you for everybody, for Shell Bell, for Station Age. Uh, we had Megan's vlogs in here. She was helping. I appreciate everybody who mods. Um, you all, y'all are a treasure. Please drop, uh, Les's link again. 
So if anybody would like to donate. Yeah, there is, Michelle, my, my Twitter, it's not letting me, it's not letting me sign in. It's, it won't send me the, you know, the text with the code. And I've asked for it until it said, okay, you're locked out because you've asked for too many times. And I'm like, well, shit, you haven't sent me the code yet. It's me. How many me's are there with my phone number? That's crazy. So anyway, I'm just, ugh, I'm frustrated with it. I'm going to keep working with it, see if I can get it back going, because that's the way I get in touch with most people. Daughter, DaughtersOfNarcisticMothers.com. Hi, lads. We were just talking about you. <laughs> we're putting your we're putting your link in here but um it's okay shell um it's it it was late it was late when i started i didn't get to announce it on twitter so it's kind of crazy but i'm so glad you're here please put Leslie's link in um thank you so much chris i appreciate you and that's les for anybody who hasn't subbed to her please just tap on her name and it'll say go to channel and uh, you can go sign up for her. But good night and I love you. You love you. Okay. Be good to yourself. You're worth it. You know, there's only one of you in this whole wide world. And you're in. So love yourself. Be good to yourself. And I will see you probably in somebody else's live stream, but um, I will see you soon. I will definitely see you Saturday at 1. Okay? Good night. Bye, pal, like Kate does. <laughs> Bye, y'all.